Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, you're all very welcome uh, to this next conference this morning on the Irish social welfare system. My name is Larry O'Connell and I'm the director in uh, the National Economic and Social Council and I'm going to be chairperson for this first session this morning. Um, I suppose we're all really getting used to these uh, Zoom events uh, and virtual events and, and it is fantastic that it facilitates so many people to be able to join us and I really would like to thank all of you for taking the time for, to be with us this morning. I think we're, we're joined from a, a, a range of people from various departments and, and, and areas of work and both people living and working in Ireland and people abroad and really in one sense that is the real strength of Zoom that it allows us to be able to uh, interact with so many people. But of course we do miss the fact that we're not able to, to, to chat to people uh, face to face uh, and hopefully that will come back soon. The motivation for the conference today was the publication by NESC in November of a report called The Future of the Irish Social Welfare System, uh, Participation and Protection. Uh, the report itself was based on uh, nine uh, working papers uh, which were discussed by the council at various intervals and I believe that all of those are maybe one uh, isn't but most of those are now published on our website and I think they really will provide a very valuable resource uh, for the policy system over the coming years. Um, the report was very, uh, was, was, uh, the work on the report was supported by a working group which was chaired by Professor Anthony McCashley from uh, Trinity College Dublin and uh, Anthony was certainly a very active and energetic uh, and inspiring chair in the working group and helped us tremendously in doing that work and we'll actually hear from Anthony at the end of today's proceedings uh, to pull out for us some of the, the key messages that will uh, have emerged during the course of our discussions today. A related motivation for the conference is to discuss the, the future of welfare systems more generally uh, and the challenges that, that the welfare systems face in responding to the new context in the, in the 21st century, century and we'll hear a lot about those challenges this morning such as new ways of working and we really wanted it to look at that in the report and in the discussion today. And in addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has really shone a light on the important role that social welfare systems play, especially in a national time of crisis. So I think we're at a very important moment uh, for ourselves here in the policy system to really reflect on how we can improve our, the Irish social welfare system. So this morning we have two plenary sessions. The first session will provide a, a strategic overview for the conference and it will, it, we have two international speakers and Anne-Marie McGowan, who is one of the authors of the report, who will provide a, 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 an overview of the report for us. We will then have a, a, a panel discussion where we'll hear the perspectives from business, trade union, community and voluntary sector, academics and from the Department of Social Protection. That will be followed uh, after a lunch break by three concurrent thematic workshops on adequacy, participation and financing. And we'll have very short inputs in those sessions and then we will get that, therefore we'll provide an opportunity for, for you to participate uh, in, in more fulsomely in the discussion. The conference will then close in a plenary when we'll hear back from the key messages of the day, as I said, from Anthony McCashin. And we'll have closing remarks from Liz Canavan who's the Assistant Secretary in the Department of Taoiseach, uh, but also chair, but a Deputy Chair of the NESC Council. So onto the main business of the day, the origins of the NESC work, which resulted in the recent report, was a request from uh, the Department of Social Protection to undertake research on the role of social insurance in the social welfare system and on the functioning of the social welfare system more generally. Throughout the project, we've worked very closely with departmental officials in particular with John McKeown, the Secretary General, General and Ronan Hessian, the Assistant Secretary. So we are really delighted that uh, the current Minister for Social Protection, Community, Rural Development in the Islands, Heather Humphreys, has joined us this morning to open the conference. So I'm going to hand over to the, the Minister now. We have a, a I think, um, so they can do that for us, can we? Good morning, everyone. Firstly, thank you to Larry O'Connell and the National Economic and Social Council for inviting me here today. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person, but I'm delighted to have the opportunity to address you all. And I want to congratulate you on what is a very insightful and thought-provoking report. 
My own Department of Social Protection has always been and continues to be an active participant and a strong supporter of the NESC. I know Ronan Hessian is on one of your panels today and many of my officials are tuned in to listen to your discussions. I would particularly like to acknowledge the participation of Marcelo Abirami Sotario, Secretary General of the International Social Security Association. I won't try to address all eight of the questions listed in your programme, but I do want to talk about a number of key challenges and initiatives. Since the start of the pandemic, the government moved swiftly to address the immediate impact on household incomes by rolling out the pandemic unemployment payment. The PUP was introduced virtually overnight by my department in order to cushion the incomes of, of workers who temporarily lost their employment. To date, over 7.3 billion euro has been spent on the scheme alone. This is in addition to over 5 billion euro provided in the form of wage subsidies, along with a range of other government measures. Research by the ESRI published last May highlighted how our social protection system softened the impact of the unemployment shock caused by the pandemic. It found that the emergency income supports introduced protected household incomes from the most severe impacts of the pandemic, and that's particularly true in relation to families on lower incomes. The next few months will no doubt bring more challenges and difficult choices. However, I want to be very clear. I recognise that some sectors will be slower to return than others, and so there will be no cliff edge to the economic and income supports on the 30th of June. The Roadmap for Social Inclusion 2020 to 2025 was approved by government and published in January 2020. The Roadmap provides a clear path for us to follow and we have already started. For example, in Budget 2021, we chose to bring in targeted social welfare measures to help individuals and families on low incomes, such as increases in the, in the rates of qualified child payment. In line with the Programme for Government commitment, the Low Pay Commission has formally begun work on examining how Ireland can move towards a living wage. I want to make sure that when people cannot work, they have access to strong social welfare safety nets. However, I also want to make sure that they don't get caught up in this net. In other words, that employment pays. I'm very pleased that the Commission on Taxation and Welfare is being established and that your report will be a key input into its deliberations. Last summer, the, the July Jobs Stimulus was announced with a focus on investing in a range of active labour market measures which are being implemented. We have also published several strategic documents such as the Further Education and Training Strategy, the National Volunteering Strategy and Our Rural Future. We are continuing to develop the successor to the Pathways to Work strategy. All of these will provide the necessary strategic vision to accompany and underpin the National Economic Plan. The work of the Pensions Commission is well underway and is due to be completed this summer. The Commission is tasked with examining the sustainability of the state pension system and the social insurance fund. The programme for government includes a commitment to maintain the state pension as the bedrock of the Irish pension system and to maintain the core weekly rates of payment. In line with that commitment, I have made it clear to the Pensions Commission that the option it puts forward to government must ensure that the state pension continues to effectively protect pensioners from poverty. Before I conclude, I want to say that today's event provides us with an opportunity to think strategically about the future of our social welfare system. There are fundamental questions that have been considered for many years and none of them are easy to answer. What sort of a system do we want? How can we ensure equity? Where do services fit? And how can we fund the system sustainably? We owe it to future generations to take the opportunity to address these questions properly so that they can inherit a modern social welfare system which caters for their needs. Thank you again for inviting me to contribute today. I look forward to the outcome of your discussions and to working with you as we continue to design the social welfare system of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Humphreys, for your input. Um, 
I think it really does help to set to get the conference off to a great start. And uh, the minister noted a number of uh, uh, issues that I think will really uh, help, you know, will come up certainly in our discussion. And I think her, her closing remarks that we owe to future generations to really think about how we can create a, a social welfare system um, that is fit for purpose for them, I think it is, is, is really, really critical. Um, so I think the uh, minister has noted the importance that the system has had in mitigating the impacts of COVID-19 and then the need to really think, think strategically about the kind of social welfare system we need in the future. And I think that leads very nicely into our, our first session. Um, but first, uh, a bit like when we're working a, a, at home, there is some housekeeping that needs to be done. Um, so just a quick run through of the functions that are available to you if you wish to get involved. Uh, I, I know we're all sort of familiar with these, but just to, to highlight it, on the bottom of the panel, in the main interface, you see participants, chat, and audio and video, video functions. So please feel free to use the chat box and to share your thoughts throughout the webinar. And please make sure that your chat is set to everyone so we can see the messages coming through. Uh, you can also chat privately for, with other attendees. Uh, just check, choose their name from the drop down menu in the chat menu. Uh, our event moderator has shared the full list of the participants in the chat along with the program of today's webinar. So I think that's very useful if you want to see who else is on this call. Um, and please feel free to add from, from to, to add from which organization you are from to your name. Uh, to, the, to do that, you just hover your mouse over the name in the participants list on the right side of the Zoom window, click on rename, and make sure to save your changes by clicking OK. Again, if you'd like to ask any questions of our guests, simply click on the chat button and type your question or comment. If at any point you can't hear us, uh, can't hear me or any of the other speakers, there is the audio settings which you can uh, attempt to try to rectify the problem yourselves. But if that doesn't help, please drop a message and our event moderators will try to do their best to help you. So now that the housekeeping is, uh, issues are out of the way, I'd like to move on to our first plenary of the conference, to, which will provide you with a strategic overview for the day. So I'm delighted we have three speakers, which will then be followed by a short question and answer session with this uh, particular session due to finish uh, at 11.15. Um, our first speaker is uh, Marcelo Abi Rami Seteno. Uh, I hope, Marcelo, that I've pronounced your name correctly and apologies if I haven't. Um, Marcelo is the Secretary General of the International Social, Social Security Association. Prior to that, he was the Secretary for Social Security at the Ministry of Finance in Brazil. He's an economist with a PhD degree from the Catholic University of Brasilia and has extensive academic and manage, managerial experience in social security. His work with the ISSA is focused on promoting excellence in social security administration, including innovative solutions to address key social security challenges around the world. So we really are delighted, Marcelo. I think you're joining us from Geneva, um, and it is great that you're able to give us a strategic overview and help set the scene for the conference today. So I'll hand over to you, Marcelo. Perfect. So, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to the to this event. I'm really happy to be here with you. So, please, if you can start my to to, to show my okay. So, uh, the topic of the topic of my presentation today uh, will be social security and social inclusion. But first of all, I, I think that the main message here as we are talking about social security as a tool, as a means to achieve social inclusion, to achieve social cohesion. So it's to, to make this link you know, between a mean, a tool, a security to a purpose that's social inclusion, social cohesion. And so the empowering whole of social security to achieve social inclusion, social cohesion. And when we are talking about social security, uh, as, as the minister uh, highlighted, she mentioned many policies. Some policies are through income protection against life risks, okay? This is one part of social security, but as she also mentioned, it's not just this. When we talk about social security, we are talking also about service, 
about the development role of social security. So uh, it's much more comprehensive social security than just providing income protection against life risks. So the, the next one, please. Okay, this is the structure of my presentation. I will begin by showing the, the new reality, how social security is facing this new reality, some global challenge, then some very important message for institutes that manage social security. How do we connect the dots between policy and implementation? Some examples of social security innovations and then the concluding remarks. The following one, please. The following one, because then is social security facing the new reality. So basically what we see, uh, social, first of all, social security is a, a policy, a tool to deal with risks that people face over their life cycle. So this is a very simple example of a life course or life cycle of a person. And then we see that uh, uh, via, through this life course, there are many instances in which social security must influence and must provide uh, some support to these people. So since the very, very early ages, when you have some uh, learning to, to grow the learning, but not just grow the learning, then afterwards, how do you build your skills for work? And then how do you provide the risk protection and supporting, supporting activity? Also, when people are in the labor market, how do we facilitate the labor mobility? How do we do the better job matching or and the, also the learning? because the, the, the skills are, 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 cha are changing and the needs for, for, for talents are changing. So how do, we, how do we make this? And afterwards, how do we provide not just pension or income support, but also adequate long-term uh, uh, care and aging? So the, the main uh, 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 message uh, that I want to, 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 to show in this slide is that Social security supports people in navigating through the key risks points in the life course. Okay, so you see that there are transitions from school to work, from childbirth and combination of work and family, what's the best work and life balance, retirement planning. So social security provides is, the, is a, a, a means of tool to provide the help to people during, the, during their life course. So providing empowerment to people in economic ways, but not just in economic ways, but also in terms of choice, skills, development, and life design. The, the, the following one, please. Okay. And then here we see that there are many risks no, that people face over their life cycle. There are some risks that are, for, that are here for a long time, and some of them that are appearing now, or that are appearing the last decades, for example. So we can see, for example, this change in family structures, also something that is happening too much here in Europe, so change, changing forms of work. So what, what we see is that the, 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 the society, the socioeconomic aspects of life, they are very dynamic. The previous risks over the life cycle, they continue to exist. Like for example, the skills mismatch, the old age, the aging, but there are new things that happens like these new forms of work, these new forms of, 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 of employment as well. Uh, and people lives are changing. Huh? There are more frequent change, there are diversification of family forms. Uh, so this continues to, to happen, how social security can be used in order to provide uh, insurance of people against this sort of risks. And one thing that I want to, to mention here is that social security is showing its value, its highly, highly relevant value 
over this big crisis that we are that we are that we are facing during this century. So when we see now uh, COVID nineteen, what was the role of Social Security in normals? No? When we see the the the, like the, the unemployment insurance, no? the high levels of unemployment insurance that should be delivered. And we were able to provide this, but not just through, un, through, through, through unemployment insurance, health, many other policies of social security that was there. And it was really a fundamental to give economic stability to the countries. Without this, the economic stability would not, would not be the same. Also political stability, because we are relieving the, the, the risks that people are facing and so political instability. Not just this, but if we go a little bit uh, back to, to the past, over when also when we see the, the, the financial crisis of 2008, 2008, 2009, we see the relevance of social security over the spirits. But this is the, the message. We see that there are many risks that people face over the life cycles and social security is there to provide this. So, Global challenge, uh, sorry, the, the next one, the next one. Then we see the global challenge uh, that people uh, uh, face that, that are, are still being faced and that social security must have a part. In. So, uh, for example, informality. We have not just, uh, we have not achieved universality in social security and the course, and of course, access to social security is something fundamental. A key issue here is informality. A large part of the global workforce is in the informal sector, and therefore they are often excluded from income support, training empowerment, and other services. These groups are extremely vulnerable to shocks, also, in advanced countries like Switzerland, where I live, uh, Ireland, and we face this challenge. For example, when we discuss the social security for platform workers and also for low income self persons. Inequalities, another global challenge. They are high in many countries. They are high in income, but not just income, but also related to gender, to health, this is high in the East agenda during this triennium, and we see that social security is one to, to, to provide some alternatives to this question. Also, response to labor market change, they are slow. So for instance, now as we see the issue of platform worker, of platform workers are is growing, is gradually, gradually being addressed. And it's one very important topic as well. Regarding uh, administration, this is one point that I will highlight over the next minutes. No? Uh, Social security is very fragmented in many countries. So there is a need for integration to develop better policies. Also, social security and activation policies are dominated in many countries by a short term view. This is something that we must need to, to, ref, to rethink. So providing, for example, providing a training course you know, to a person for six months, getting people off the benefits list. You know? So many, many very short term and we need a more a long term perspective. Also, the challenge of building more resilient systems you know, that, being, that has been dominated in our agenda since 15 months since the COVID crisis. And some words about the, the COVID-19 no? is to, that we need to highlight the coverage gaps, uh, the increase, uh, the, the high inequalities, the accelerate labor market change to digital economy. So all these points were, were stressed via the, the COVID-19. The next one, so there is one point, there are policies, but we need to implement that policy. And this is where one part where ESA really works, that's the implementation of policies. No? So when we see uh, social security policies, we see that there are many different policies, education, skilling, active labor market policies, childcare, many, many of them. 
And when we see these points, no, uh, the, uh, the major challenge that we have, the, all of them have the purpose for getting people out of the poverty line or decreasing inequalities or do two different things. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, these are their main, their main perspectives. But then it shows that we have these many different policies and we need to have an integration between these policies. No? So it it's shows no, the, the relevance and the importance of making uh, an alignment and also a coordination of these policies. So uh, points that we need to see the, for to overcome this policy fragmentation and also silo implementation is an incremental approach to inclusion. So inclusion requires time. So importance of tracking incremental improvements, uh, barriers to inclusion, also preventive approach that are required to detect risks earlier, social assistance programs that must nurture productive worker and employability and also transition to social insurance, income support service service and active labor market that must be coordinated to align and support so this requires a board view on how to address the barriers to active so some point that we need to see uh, so uh, more than ever when we see that the implementation capacities for these policies are key and it's also an, an appropriate and necessary investment that there is a need to be a coordination between these points and this last price of the COVID it showed this. The next one, please. So we are seeing uh, in ESA many countries that are doing innovation in social security. So in, the, in these parts of life cycle and how social security can address life cycle. So, so this is just to mention some examples. And we have examples from Malta, Tunisia, Uruguay, Australia, France. So we see that over the countries, uh, 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 social security is doing this part. No? We see it's slow, but we see this and we have a, a, a database of good practice. And for my, sorry, the next one, mm, sorry. The next one, the next one. Okay, sorry, I didn't ask you to, to go to the phone. And now the next one, the conclude, the next one, the next one. Okay, so this, okay, the previous one, that's the concluding remarks. Uh, so uh, what we are seeing, we are seeing more frequent life and work transitions. No? So work uh, has become more normal standard and risk transitions they have increased. Also, the empowering role of social security is key to active and inclusion. Social security as protection against income shocks as facilitator of employability through development role. So the incremental approach for social security. And what we see is that uh, uh, there are long stand challenge that remain unsolved and new risks on the rise. So at the same time that we are facing new risks, we see that the long-term challenge continue. So I think that my time is finishing now. So uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, uh, the Irish welfare system for, for this invitation. And I'm very happy to see in the, at this first debate that you are providing technical fundamentals to political decisions. So I think this is really remarkable when we see a situation and we need to have some political decisions, but these political decisions are being technically fundamental in order to give the best uh, policy to the, to the people. But when we talk about implementation, we need to see uh, uh, all the coordination of these different policies. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marcelo, and I think that really does get us off to a, a really great start in terms of setting the context for today's uh, discussion. I think you're, the emphasis you place on the life course certainly resonates for us in the work in NESC uh, going back to 2005 when we looked at this area, the developmental welfare state, really emphasised that life course 
But I think what you're helped us to do today is understand that those transitions along the life course are, are now, you know, there's almost more of them and the more diversity and more subtlety in terms of the changes and the supports that we need to provide. So I think that's very, very useful. I think also that you made the comment that the, you know, social security can't do it alone. And, you know, I think again, that's something we, we really believe in NESC is very, very important and that we really need to grapple with how we sort of, you know, innovation and services and how we, you know, respond on that, on that front. So I think in that context, some of the, the innovations in the countries you mentioned, I think would be very, very useful for us to and maybe to come back to hopefully in the discussion. Uh, and I think the final point is, is really well made around the need to coordinate and integrate policies. I think that's really, really important. So, so I think they're really, as I say, a great start for the, for the conversation. So I'm going to call on next uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Anne McGowan, who's a policy analyst in NESC. Uh, Anne-Marie's background is in, 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 you know, in gender and family studies, but in NESC, she's been uh, working on a very wide range of uh, topics, including housing, uh, extensive work on jobless households a number of years ago and uh, Anne-Marie with uh, Helen Johnson was, was the co-author of, of the, this report that we're discussing today. Uh, interestingly, Anne-Marie has just finished a, a report on uh, digital inclusion in Ireland, which again was a topic that you, you mentioned, Marcelo, so I think it's very timely. Um, so Anne-Marie, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I think the slides will come up now in a minute. Um, I'm just going to talk today about um, the um, report which myself and my colleague Helen Johnson wrote, The Future of the Irish Welfare System. So I'll outline the background, some of the key issues that were brought up in the research and then our recommendations for the future. So as Larry has said, um, the work was done after a request from the Department of Social Protection in 2018, and we prepared a range of background papers um, on issues from challenges to the welfare system, integrated income supports, income and wealth inequality, changes in employment, etc. And these are available on the NESC website. And then the work of these papers was then discussed by the working group chaired by Professor Tony McCashin and led to the publication of the report in November 2020. So Marcelo has talked about some of the challenges and opportunities that face welfare systems internationally, such as changing family structures, issues of population aging, because we have an aging population, which um, means some challenges in terms of how to fund pensions. There is also the role of the welfare system in combating inequality of income and wealth, and in Ireland, we have been very successful using the welfare and tax systems in reducing market income inequality down to average levels within the EU. And we have managed to keep those levels of income inequality consistent over the last 30 years, which is really quite a feat because those levels of income inequality have increased in other EU countries. However, we do have growing wealth inequality which can be related a lot to changes in housing ownership as that's the main source of wealth in Ireland. And I think some of those changes really raise strong questions for the welfare system going forward. For example, we have relatively low pension payments from the state system in Ireland. And this is linked to the fact that older people have very low housing costs. They normally own their own home or they're living in low rent local authority housing. How will pensions in Ireland in the future grapple with an increasing number of people in the private rental sector? And we can also see that, um, you know, through various uh, crises over the last 15 years, that the welfare system has had to, you know, come up with a lot of new ways of supporting people who've lost their jobs, who have mortgages. And then in the areas of pensions, occupational pensions now are increasingly defined contribution, not defined benefit. A lot of occupational pension funds are facing low interest environments and funding deficits. So that means that the role of the state pension becomes more important. So there are big issues for our system going forward. And then there are changes due to globalization. That really has been a big opportunity for Ireland. We have been able to massively grow the number of people in employment. Um, but obviously there are changing patterns of work and typically those in atypical work, in platform work and self-employment pay lower PRSI contributions. So that's an issue for our system. There's a changing balance of world power. You know, the welfare systems we have were built on European growth and wealth. And as Asian countries become more powerful, is that going to mean competitive pressures to reduce spending on welfare? 
climate change is another issue. Are we going to be looking at more competition for exchequer funding to climate change issues versus welfare issues? And the issues of ambivalent support for welfare provision is also important. Different groups support different kinds of welfare. Some people like to see means tested payments. Some people like to see universal payments. Um, everybody really supports pension payments, but there are divided opinions on unemployment benefits. I think it's important to say, though, that the welfare state is very resilient. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it declining, but it, it persists. Voters are very attached to it. And as Marcelo said, we've really seen its important role during COVID really shows that market um, solutions just can't work at the scale that the welfare state can. So where did NEST see the welfare system going in the future in Ireland? We can see a range of types of um, welfare states ranging from means testing mainly, such as in the US, right up to a reliance on universal payments in Nordic countries. Ireland has a mix of PRSI or social insurance payments and social assistance or means tested payments. And we feel that that will continue to exist in Ireland, but that we should move towards more social insurance and within that have more tapering of removal of welfare supports to support people into the workforce. So now I'll talk about the four main areas of recommendations that NESC has in the report. So the first recommendations are about ensuring income adequacy and alleviating poverty. So NESC recommended that welfare payments, um, a mechanism would be introduced to provide advice on how to increase them to government and to make sure that these payments are adequate to prevent poverty. The report also recommends a new approach to child income support that as well as universal child benefit, that there would also be an automatic payment to children in low income families. This payment would combine the funds for qualified child um, allowances, which are paid to those in welfare payments and working family payment. And this payment would be paid automatically. So rather than people having to apply for working family payment when they move into employment, there would be a smoother transition in terms of support for child for children. We also stressed how important it is to have supportive services to keep people out of um, poverty. And I know Mary will say more about that. So I won't um, go into too much detail here on this. Our second set of recommendations are around how to modernize the welfare system to reflect family, gender and care needs nowadays. So we recommended that there would be greater individualization in the social welfare system. And actually the Citizens Assembly on Gender Equality just recommended that last weekend. So we would like to see the changes that were made to lone parents who were dependent on welfare payments um, over the last number of years extended to qualified adults, which would mean that those who are within a couple who is dependent on welfare payments would also, once their youngest child has reached the age of seven, engage with the welfare system. And this was actually recommended by the Department of then Social and Family Affairs back in 2006. It would be important to learn from the changes that were made to loan parent payments and job seekers transition to make sure that that worked as well as possible. We also recommend that aspects of individualization that are seen internationally would be extended to couples in Ireland in receipt of welfare benefits. So for example, in Australia, both partners in a couple have to apply separately for welfare payments. Um, their income is means tested together and the payment is automatically split between the couple. In the Netherlands, time spent taking care of children counts for um, eligibility for welfare payments. And that's something that could be looked at here as well. We also recommend a better balance um, for work and family commitments because we can see when we look at patterns of work that are desired by uh, families with children in Ireland that they would like to see one person working full time and one part time and how do we support that within our system. We also recommended a review of transferability of marriage based tax credits because these uh, credits can be transferred between couples who are married who don't have children, while cohabiting couples with children cannot transfer these credits. What is the main aim behind the transfer of these credits? If it's to support children, then I think we need to look at how um, we do that. So in the report, NESC recommends a review of these uh, transferable credits. Our third set of recommendation are around supporting high participation within the welfare system and more widely. 
So Nesk recommended that a tripartite group or similar body be set up to look at how we can deal with the changing world of work. And for example, the contributions paid by those in self-employment, in platform work and in atypical work. We also recommended a more inclusive public employment service and that that service would continue to engage and develop its engagement with those who are more distant from the labour force. So qualified adult partners of main claimants, um, those in atypical work um, and NEETs, young people who are not in employment, education or training, for example. We recommend that a pilot participation income scheme is put into place that would recognise the role of those who are caring and carrying out volunteer work, but who are not eligible for um, the range of schemes that currently exist. And we also recommended support for low paid workers without children. So could the working family payment be amended to support those without children in poverty? Or could uh, refundable tax credits be introduced? That would need to be done carefully to avoid disincentives, but there is a need to support those who are low paid without children. And then the issue of enhancing financial sustainability is the fourth main set of recommendations. So under this, we recommend three options in the NESC report about increasing funding to the welfare system, managing expenditure from it and other actions outside this. So in terms of increasing funding to the welfare system, that's about tax as well as PRSI. So the report recommends increasing PRSI rates, especially for the self-employed who are now eligible for almost all PRSI payments, but pay a much lower proportion of their income package uh, into the PRSI system. We recommended a review of capital taxes and particularly their exemptions because some of these are very high, for example, in terms of inheritance, that a, per a person can inherit a third of a million euros tax-free from a parent, for example. We recommend uh, capping tax expenditures or tax reliefs um, and reviewing these yearly, so having a much greater focus on the scale and range of these. And also considering multiple rates of tax. We only have two, and in a digital age, it would be easier to have multiple rates of tax that are more tailored to different levels of income. In terms of managing expenditure out of the welfare system, there are some challenging issues here that NESC recommends we look at. For example, the age at which people receive their pensions. Um, when pensions were first brought in, people lived about one or two years after the age of retirement. Now in Ireland, people live on average 20 years after they retire. So, you know, that's an issue that has to be looked at. Some countries also have surcharges. You know, those who have higher incomes pay a surcharge or a tax on their estate uh, pension so that they um, receive less compared to lower income earners. And then some countries have what they call automatic balancing systems. So when payments out of PRSI systems become too high and the fund is too low, there's an automatic review of the level of payment from it. Other actions, we could look at increasing the number of people in employment that helps to raise income and PRSI contributions. It may mean more migration. And then there are other things that we can do, for example, looking at affordable housing to help reduce pension payments in future and the level of tax relief, for example, around pensions. Who does that benefit? Is it the most effective use of this funding? Then as Marcelo said, it's important to look at implementation and the NESC report contains recommendations on this. For example, the importance of strong leadership, good plans for implementation, skilled teams, and also anticipating what vested interests will say and being prepared to deal with the objections that they may have to um, changes. It's also we, important, we feel, to do more work on the level of public support for welfare change and to build on the findings of this in changes made going forward. We recommend some administrative reforms, for example, a working group to carry out an audit of inconsistencies. For example, there are very different income disregards among different welfare payments. Could that become more streamlined? And also, could there be a single portable means test? For example, at the moment, you could be applying for job seekers assistance and rent supplement at the same time, but they're two separate means tests. And that's something that digitalization can uh, assist. We recommend restructuring rates and bans of PRSI and USC for low income earners, because for those earning between 15 and 23,000, there are actually six changes in those levels over that um, small income increase. And finally, we recommend good data and research 
For example, we know very little about qualified adults, about those in platform work, in contingent work, and about needs. So we really need more information on these groups so that we can look at the supports they need and how the welfare system can support them um, in terms of poverty and better incomes and moves into the workforce. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion later today. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Uh, it's, it's no small feat to, to summarise in 15 minutes uh, such a large report and uh, nine accompanying background papers. So thanks so much for that. Um, I think one of the, the lines that's important to remember in the, in the report, I think very early makes the statement that the Irish social welfare system is not in crisis. And I think that was important because what we were trying to signal was what's needed is, is an opportunity to really reflect in a very thoughtful way and probe how it could be improved. And I think that's what, you know, Anne-Marie has brought out. You can, you can see that thoughtfulness about thinking about future generations, for example, and the issues, the very different issues that face in relation to pensions, in relation to housing costs, the nature of the tenure. And, and I think even we bring out the climate change in terms of the impact on the next generation. It's neat to think about those in a thoughtful way. And I think the second thing that Amory's presentation brought out is, is that the report has produced some very practical suggestions on very specific things uh, and that the people in the system can now uh, uh, reflect upon and look at how we might actually move forward. So thank you very much for that, Amory. Um, so it now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our third speaker for this session, uh, Professor Mary Daly. Uh, Mary is Professor of Sociology and Social Policy at the University of Oxford and uh, her research interests and expertise are very much international in scope in terms of comparative work that she's done in areas such as poverty, family, gender, equality, to name but a few. Uh, and Mary is very well known to us here in NEST having uh, uh, served very dutifully for, us, uh, for a term on the council which I think ended in about 2017, Mary. Uh, so. We're really delighted to see you uh, again today and we really look forward to hearing your, your presentation. So if I hand over to you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Larry. Good morning, everybody. I was going to say hello, Dublin, but Dublin doesn't have the same kind of capital cachet that it used to have. Maybe we'd have a new capital. So I'll just say hello, Ireland. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I want to say first that I welcome the report very much. It bears all the hallmarks of the usual NESC quality, in my view. It is intellectually uh, very informed and aware, and it's also very robust in terms of the evidence it considers for Ireland, but also internationally. And I also just want to say that I really value the evidence producing that NESC is involved in. Uh, it seems to me that that's escalated, not just for this report, but perhaps it's for this report. So um, rather than um, talk about the detail of the report, because I imagine that will come up this afternoon, I thought I'd focus more broadly on um, the kind of model in a way and the kinds of the challenges in particular. So in part, I will stay in my short presentation. I will stay within the parameters of the report, but I also want to move beyond in key respects to make reference to things we know about the Irish system and the way it performs, but also what we're learning from developments elsewhere. And I'm going to factor COVID in because it's important, I think, for how we, uh, the assumptions we make about COVID profoundly affect how we judge and plan for the future. I have three slides. The first part aims to kind of take general stock of where we are, including COVID. The second part, I go on to query the model or approach that underlies the report, the developmental welfare state. I think real questions have to be posed about the feasibility of that model going forward. And then following on from this in the third slide, I highlight some things that I think we need to urgently address. So could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. 
Um, so as we stay, take stock of where we are, and the report does this very well, I think, um, it's important to highlight the achievements of the Irish welfare state, particularly in the last five years or so. But in doing that, I suppose we also have to acknowledge the damage wreaked on the Irish welfare system during the worst of the Troika period between 2010 and 2014. But that said, for a few years predating COVID, I think we saw expansion and an appetite for a significant reform in the Irish uh, welfare state. And then there are a number of achievements to highlight from that, the fall in measured poverty, the introduction of uh, greater flexibility, um, the attention to childcare and to um, work-life balance, for example, free GP care for children, to just name but a few. And of course, as has been referenced here already, the last year has seen the Irish welfare system uh, in, involve in significant innovation and reform. And Ireland, you know, through the pandemic unemployment payment and the temporary wage subsidy scheme in particular, Ireland showed the capacity to major reform. And this is significant, I suppose, in a country that, on, in my view, tends to reform its social policies rather slowly. I also think there are other positive things to note, the inclusion of the self-employed and those in a range of what we might think of as non-traditional employment situations, the inclusion of asylum seekers, albeit that it came late, and the help with housing costs and the ban on evictions. These are all things to build on, I think, and it, particularly the kind of notion of inclusivity is important. Much has been made, and I suppose rightly so, of the PUP's rapid introduction, its relative generosity, and its individualized and non-means tested basis. I think all of these are important, but their significance for the Irish welfare state, I think, are kind of compromised in two respects. One is they're temporary, the PUP is temporary, and some of the other things are introduced to temporary. And the second is they're relatively unique. Um, so I don't need to say anything about the temporary nature, that's obvious. But by the unique nature, I'm referring to the fact that the PUP was created for a separate class of unemployed people, different and more privileged in relation to the existing unemployed claimants who got just a slight uplift in their payment for the spouse or partner. And I think this is important to say, and, and it also to me raises an underlying question that I haven't heard discussed very much in relation to the welfare state in Ireland. And that is whether the kind of automatic stabilizers that are built into our welfare system, principally through unemployment and sickness benefits, how well they work during the pandemic. And I want to just raise the question of the fact that we had to introduce a completely new payment does raise some doubts about the automatic stabilizers in our system. And this raises a question, I think, about social insurance and how little or how much we kind of have been moving away from social insurance payments um, or social insurance basis of the system. And this is raised in the report and is something I think that does really need discussion. And it's also being raised actually in the UK at the moment. And it could be part of us seizing the opportunity of COVID to make significant reforms. The next slide, please. Um, in this slide, I want to raise questions, as I said, about the developmental welfare state model and whether it is feasible going forward. And I think it's probably not just a question of its feasibility going forward, uh, which of course we have to factor in, co in uh, COVID, but even I think in normal welfare, welfare state uh, or circumstances, there are weaknesses in this model and it's a very demanding model in some respects. Um, and you know, I think I don't have to say it, that it's based on the tripartite structure of income support, service provision and community engagement. Um, in key respects, the developmental welfare state uh, model makes sense and has significant strengths. Marcelo talked about the lifelong life course uh, programming that's involved, which has seen policies in Ireland span the age range and provide for very specific categories of the population. The emphasis on smoothening transitions is also really important, and Marcelo showed that in his slide as well, as is the emphasis on skills and retraining. 
But there are problems that seem resistance to the appeal of this model. And one in particular is persistent poverty and the bunching of um, disadvantage and poverty among particular sectors of the population. And in a way, the latter is in some ways a denial of a life course framework, because actually it doesn't matter what stage of the life course you're at for certain categories of the population, poverty seems to be your destiny. And these, the people who are subject to poverty and social exclusion are the same people everywhere, really. Those with low education, those parenting alone, those suffering from or trying to be a carer for people with a range of illness or functional impairments. And there's a regularity and long-term patterning in all of this that is kind of frightening, I think. And it's the hard edge, as I see it, of the challenges facing the Irish welfare state. And we might rightly congratulate ourselves on reducing poverty, but we still have 13% of the population uh, at risk of poverty and social exclusion, and nearly 6% in consistent poverty, and 17% in enforced deprivation. So there are questions, I think, about the appropriateness of uh, the development welfare state, because as I understand it, it doesn't significantly problematize poverty per se. It has other considerations. And I just need this in the second part of this slide very quickly also want to say that it's a very demanding model, actually, and we're learning more and more about it as it's uh, being put into effect in different countries. And I have three things that I think uh, I want to highlight here that we should question whether Ireland can actually meet the demands of the system. The first is it has very strong labour market requirements and the focus on activation, for example, requires a vibrant labour market that can provide sufficient jobs and sufficient good quality jobs um, to enable people to live a life that's not on that's not in poverty. The whole principle of tapering benefits, for example, depends on income progression. And it's not to me uh, by any means clear that Ireland satisfies the labour market requirements, because like elsewhere, our job growth or a lot of our job growth has been in the low paid low paid flexible jobs in the labor intensive services sector, which are also the jobs that are probably most likely to be affected by COVID. The second thing very quickly is that the developmental welfare state requires a very well resourced infrastructure and so has very demanding infrastructure requirements, particularly in relation to training and also a more broad service infrastructure around childcare and other supportive care related services. I mean, at root, it's actually based on the Danish model, which has a very comprehensive and integrated system of unemployment supports and retraining and reemployment option. So I think if we want to aspire to be uh, to have a developmental welfare state, we need to actually put even more resources than we have done into um, training and infrastructure. The third thing is the math, the so-called Matthew effect, and the term comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, um, the principle of to him who has more will be given. And this is something that emerging research on the social investment perspective, or in the Irish case, the uh, developmental welfare state model is picking up, that actually in the big rush to provide services, activation, early education, and so forth, it is those who are already relatively well-placed who benefit most. This is particularly coming up in terms of childcare um, with uh, low-income families, less likely in most countries. We don't have really the evidence of this for Ireland yet, but low-income families in most countries are ethnic minority families who are least likely to avail of childcare. So my underlying point to be brief is to query whether the conditions are in place for a developmental welfare state in Ireland and whether it is even the best model, because, as I said, it doesn't particularly have poverty or uh, economic inequality in its sides. But if we are to go for it, I think it needs far more resources than it currently has and a stronger commitment to stronger uh, to supportive services. My final slide, please. So taking account of COVID and thinking also of COVID-19, I want to underline four things that deserve special attention in my view. Some of these are in the report or I draw from the report on them. And I would like again, just to say that I value the many new ideas and the taking up of some old ideas that are in the report. 
But I, I do suggest that our deliberation should range broader than that, and that we need to think about major structural reforms as well. The idea of the participation income, which actually I don't think Anne-Marie mentioned, but that really struck, uh, you know, struck me from the report. Um, volunteering and care are mentioned in this context. And I think a participation income is important for several reasons, not least in a situation where COVID-19 will seriously affect the job market. But a participation income is not about keeping the unemployed occupied or not only even, not only about that. It's much more about giving people the opportunity to engage in valuable activities and recognizing areas of life that are valuable in their own right. So it has the actual potential to overturn a paradigm which sees value only in what is paid. And the pandemic, of course, has, has invited us to reassess what we consider as valuable. And I think we've done that much more at a personal level than we have done at a systemic level. So the, a, 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 a participation income is really important in this context, but I think there are also risks in it. Um, not least around creating a second tier of activity and rewarding it at too low a level. And it's for this reason that I think the participation income should be considered alongside a universal basic income, which gets a bit of a short shrift in the report, I have to say. Yes, there are worries about the cost, but I'm not sure that the evidence suggests that a UBI or a universal basic income disincentivizes employment to the extent implied in the report. What's too little developed in the report is uh, service provision. And this is a huge issue and should be to me an equal part of the welfare state with our income support or taxation system. And I think in Ireland, that's a bit of a struggle for us. And while expenditure in has increased greatly in some service areas in Ireland, and the trend has been upward, we tend, we tend to come from a backward position or a kind of a rear guard position in this regard. Thirdly, one of the most difficult areas as we move forward is to address what I'm thinking about as the settlements around private life, and I'm meaning gender, but also care and the place of children and others who may be in a vulnerable situation. The report underlines a commitment to gender, in, uh, to gender uh, equality, but I think its main orientation is to make women's lives like those of men, rather than to question the system more broadly. We've had a different set of proposals come from the Citizens Assembly on the weekend, which, as Anne-Marie said, also takes up some of the same issues, but in my view goes broader. And the basic problem is that we haven't yet devised an equality respecting system to replace the full time caretaking labor of women in the home. The promise of equality and fair shares between women and men is not realized. And I see that as an invitation to think about how we value care and caregiving and those who give it. And I have to say that we haven't done that well on that during the pandemic. And just one statistic or, or fact to give you, and I'm almost finished, Larry, is that um, we're only one of five member states who didn't introduce any special leave for parents to care for their children due to school closures or sickness uh, in the lockdown. Finally, I think the aims of our system also has to be re, uh, have to be reconsidered. The report sets out nine principles, including equity and solidarity. And these are all important, but it doesn't set out, it doesn't make particular mention of social justice and anti-poverty as markers of the kind of welfare state and society that we want to achieve. And so I can end by underlining that I think those are really, uh, really important goals and, um, uh, and that I obviously can do no more than name check these issues, but I think it's important to put them on the table. And I believe that was also the reason I was invited to speak. So I hope they will come up in the question and answer session, but also in the discussions later today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That uh, it's, it's a, a wonderful tour through, as you say, but the strengths in the reports, but also things that we need to think about further. And, and that's, I think, was a key part of our objective in hosting the conference today was to, to have a conversation about uh, work and issues that could be, uh, uh, that we could do more on. I think um, you've raised, I mean, it's, it's really well put the way you put it, the persistent poverty, it, you know, <coughs> that's the hard edge, but, but also you said that it's, it's, it's a recurring theme in lots of countries, that it's the same group with the same type of characteristics. 
that we don't reach and that we don't support. And, and that's very uh, important to sort of really think about that. Um, I, I think some of the, the issues you, you raise are, um, for us are, are, are very challenging to think about, I think, in terms of, you know, you put the question, is the development welfare, DWS, is it even the right way to think about it? I think that's important to pose the question that way. And I know uh, one question posed to you was to think about, well, what would be the alternative? So we might come back to that in, in the discussion. Um, and I think also just to mention, I think you're absolutely right that the service provision piece it, you know, it, it is the area that we need to do more on and just not to excuse the report, but we, we were focused in this report unashamedly on the income piece while, while all the time knowing that we were sort of not taking the other parts of the tripod in this particular piece of work, but we're very aware it's something we need to come back to. So before it just opens, we're going to have a, a, a short Q&A. We're going to be joined by uh, Helen Johnson, who uh, was the co-author of the report, uh, with Anne-Marie McGowan. Um, Helen uh, has worked in NEST since about uh, 2007, I think, and prior to that, she was the director of the Combat Poverty Agency. So she has a, a, a long history in working in this particular area. So Helen will be, will be uh, heavily involved throughout the rest of the day, but we we're very keen that she would join this panel discussion uh, for, for the closing part this morning. So um, we've got a number of uh, questions in the chat and I would just encourage people uh, if, if they want to, 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 to put up questions that we, we will come back to them. Um, and I, I think we, we, we might just, just start with, with a question um, around that maybe, Mary, just to you that, that, that Helen posed in a sense of, well, if it isn't DWS, what, what would be the model that you, you think we might uh, embrace or think about in Ireland? That's a huge, that's a huge question, Larry. So, I mean, my problem with the DWS, I think, is around the kind of activation, the focus on the reliance on the labor market to take people really out of poverty. And I think that the labor market doesn't deliver really. And it's probably the risk is that it probably won't, it will be less able to deliver um, up to now. And I, I know the living wage and all of that is important, but there are questions about whether that's a plaster really on a system that doesn't just give decent working conditions to people and a decent income and also a kind of a career trajectory going forward because everybody wants to feel I think that they're they're progressive so I feel that um, I think we should have all the things that the DWS have and more um, because I, I really think Income support is hugely important adequate income support measures that really target also the um, those who are excluded really or cannot kind of partake of the system in the way that the DWS thinks about it. Um, but then I'm also kind of saying, look, let's rethink it all really. And why is it that care is completely undervalued and underpaid? And I'm raising questions about whether a participation income is sufficient to value care. The risk is that you have a second tier system. So I want actually us all to, op I want us to open up the whole model really to scrutiny. And I just think, as I said, that COVID, we should, we, we have to do that. We're obligated to do that in a situation where COVID-19 has such a major effect on us, I think. Okay, thanks, Mary. And I, I know that some of the questions in the, in the discussion were just maybe wanted to zone in a little bit more on the, on the basic income question. And I, I don't know, if Marcella, would you like to comment on that side before we sort of come to? Okay, well, uh, my, my position is that the basic income should be a very, very first pillar to a more comprehensive uh, social security perspective. But some points that I, I'd like to, to mention during this, this, this webinar, the, going with the, the, the points that are being talked here, uh, I see that you are going with a very good technical perspective, fundamentals, but then it will come to the political arena, and then we have to find what will be the equilibrium between the what are the technical fundamentals and the political uh, possibility that we can find to, to find an equilibrium behind this. And one an, another point that I'd like to, to mention is to focus also on the implementation of these policies, because 
Uh, sometimes we can have a very good fundamental for, for reaching these policies, also getting a political improvement for getting, for getting these policies. But then when we go to the implementation, we can see, see some fails in which this Matthews effect that, that uh, Mary mentioned, it can happen. So to take a look in a more comprehensive way, but uh, basically these are my main points. Thank you. And I, I mean, just on that, somebody, uh, Lima has just asked, all of it, I mean, thinking about that, the political challenges of doing that, it's a participatory income. Helen, do you want to come in on that and then I'll bring you back in, Mary, maybe on that question? Yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, I mean, we do look in quite a lot of detail at the basic income. I, I think in the overall report, it, it we don't give it uh, that much attention, but uh, there is a background paper that reviews the operation of basic incomes in other countries and tries to take learnings from that. Um, I, I think that the, uh, the political point that Marcella mentions um, is, is critical, that a lot of countries have tried it mainly as a pilot, and it's been quite successful in some countries. But two points are, uh, one is that it, it's rarely, if ever, uh, a universal basic income. Usually there are conditions attached to it. Quite often it's targeted at low income groups. And it has been seen to be quite successful there in terms of giving people opportunities to do things. And it hasn't affected employment participation. But secondly, these these pilots or these attempts have not been continued. Um, they tend to be discontinued after a period of time. So I think there is learning there, but I think politically it's, it's quite difficult, although it is being tried now uh, for, for culture and artists in, in Ireland. So it'd be interesting to see how that possibly uh, would progress. Just on the participation income, I think you're right about the danger of a two-tier system, and that's certainly not what we would advocate. But in previous work that we did, particularly around jobless households, we find that a lot of people are actually very active in their communities and very supportive in their communities and receiving no recognition for that and find it difficult to get onto existing schemes. Um, and if they could, and for some people who did, you know, it's a progression. Um, and I think that's maybe not fully recognised. And I think piloting a participation income is kind of a place-based approach of what's available locally and so on would encourage and acknowledge the contribution that people are making. And there would be the opportunity for them to progress or not, as they so wished. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. And, and just, just to, because we're conscious of the time, maybe just change tack a little bit. Um, Mary, you are sorry, Marcella, you focused on your report about the importance of getting it right from the start for children. And, and I think I, I'm just interested in this, exploring that a little bit with you and also with you, Mary, because I know you've done a lot of work on, on you know, really looking at that, at that question of parental support and what we can do. And I'm trying to link that to a question in the chat about trying to ask us to think about the interconnectivity across social policy domains the complexities of lived uh, of people's experiences that don't neatly fall into it. So I, I just wonder if you could talk about that challenge, Marcelo, first of what it means or, or your experience of getting it right from the start. And I might bring Mary in then. And Anne-Marie, I know there's some specifics on the report, so maybe you'd come in on that question as well. Mm -hmm. um, i go to you first, Marcelo. Yes, uh, because the, the approach is the, the approach of uh, over the life cycle. And so when we think about social security, most countries just think about the old age people. It's not like this. Uh, we have to think over the entire life cycle. And since the very, very beginning, because this will be the future of countries. I come from a developing country. So if you do not invest in the, in the people at the very, very early, early age, it will be a continuation of this poverty and inequality. So we must focus this by giving them uh, not just the care, but also the training and, and, and learning that they must uh, have to, 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 to overcome the poverty line. Okay, thanks for that. And Mary, do you come in on that question? Just... Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we all recognize the importance of getting in early, although, you know, some of the neuroscience stuff is now being questioned about the, the you know, the importance of the, thousand days or whatever. But my concern would be always about those who are elite, who are most disadvantaged, really. And as I said, we know now that the universal services and so highly subsidized state services tend to be to the benefit and tend to be uh, used more by the higher income or those who are already well off relatively within the system. So we need, I think, targeting as well as a kind of uni the universalism that is implied in the developmental welfare state. 
Um, I don't know whether you want me also just to say about the participatory income, because I think that's really important discussion we should be having. And just in response to Valeska's uh, thing, Valeska's query, I actually think there might be political appetite in Ireland for that, actually. And I think it could be a way that Ireland might show leadership. Um, because in a way, the community development schemes are in many ways a kind of a recognition and valuing of um, of, of you know participation and societal contribution. And I've I was delighted that they survived the Troika, really. And I know they're always, when international organizations do reviews, they say they don't lead to labor market and so forth. But actually, I think you could look at them as another way, in another way, which is as actually a form of participation income and recognition of the value of local work and local engagement for local people. Great. Thanks so much, Mary. Anne-Marie, did you, do you want to comment on that? Just that question, <laughs> I'm getting it right from, from the start. Yes, um, I think it's key. And I suppose, you know, the another thing I was thinking of was the importance of um, focusing funds on transitions. So like transitions to school or transitions out of school are really, really important. What happens to young people who kind of get lost in the transition out of school? Um, and we talk a lot about the transition for people on welfare, particularly with families to move into employment. It would be really useful to maybe have case management officers who focus particularly on groups then and who are able to deal with a range of services to make sure that people, because people can really get stuck like um, in an earlier report that Helen and I worked on on jobless households, we could see, for example, that when somebody finishes um, at the time uh, community employment, they just went straight back onto the live register. There was no like focused management of like, you know, now we're going to try and connect you with employers because a lot of these people had worked, you know, they had a good year or two years work experience behind them. And if they just went back onto the live register, it was... It was so, so defeating for them and, and kind of a waste as well. So the transitions and, um, you know, the kind of tailored supports for particular groups, I think are really important. And that would go down to the first 1,000 days for children who are at risk or whose parents have particular vulnerabilities. Focus supports for them are just can pay off so, so well, I really think. Thanks, Anne-Marie. I'm very conscious of the time, but I'm just going to t ask you all one question just, just before we close. So the Irish government, we've just announced to have a commission on tax and welfare. If you had to give them one suggestion as the key priority uh, that they should address, let's say take their first 100 days, uh, what would that be? So I, I, I might start with Marcelo and then come to my colleagues in ESC and finish with you, Mary, on that. So Marcelo. OK, have a very good coverage for social, for social policy in the sense that, as Mary uh, mentioned, there's Matthew's effects. And so to, to, to see the, the people who really need and focus on these people, also think about the sustainability of the entire uh, system in order that we are providing something to people, promising something that we can keep this promise over time. Thank you very much, very succinct. I go to your head next, Helen, and then Anne-Marie. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think we, we will talk more about it in the uh, workshop this afternoon, but the financing of the system, I think, um, has to be critical, and it's a tax and welfare. So bearing in mind the welfare requirements, how are we going to raise the tax? And I think there's lots of potential there um, for new instruments to do that. Thank you very much, Helen. And actually, I think Audrey Reid put in a comment about tax reforms as well, I think, and expenditures and that, so that we'll, we'll pick that up as well. So Anne-Marie, before I go to Mary to, to close. So. Uh, yeah, I'd, well, I'm sure that the Commission are going to focus a lot on uh, tax expenditures or tax reliefs. You know, they're sometimes called a hidden welfare state, like estimates of like from several billion to up to 15 billion a year, depending how you define it, going to um, tax expenditures. So I think it's, you know, and I, I benefit from some of these, I have to say, but at the same time, I think, you know, why am I, you know, I'm not somebody who particularly needs these benefits. You know, I think a focus on like who needs the supports and who's getting them would be really important to look at. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And uh, Mary? Um uh, well, I, I think I would focus on, because others haven't said it, what I think of as the settlements in private life, really, the kind of privatization of so much 
of the problems in Ireland, whether we think of that privatization to family and to women, or even to markets and private providers. And I just think we need a more robust system of public support of private life and to see actually the problems in private life as a source of growth and development. You know, long-term care, for example, can be a source of quality uh, and, and actually meeting need rather than a source of unmet needs. So to think differently, I think, but to focus on the areas that aren't always focused on. Thank you so much, Mary. So I, I'd say we're, we're, we're sadly out of time. It's been really a uh, fascinating discussion. So obviously just to thank Anne-Marie and Helen for the work that's inspired this conference and, and you'll hear from both of them later in the day. Uh, but I really want to thank Marcelo for, for coming in on board today. It's been really great. Uh, and I think it's great also for us to have just made the contact with you and people in the system here to, to have uh, uh, seen you, to heard, heard more about your organization, what you do. So. We really thank you very much for participating. And Mary, to you, as always, I think it's really, really thoughtful. I think you've, you know, it's, it's fantastic that you've gone through the report and the detail you've had, you've done, and that you've pointed out to us uh, things that we should be thinking about. And I think your closing remark that we need to think differently is one that sums up very well the, 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 this session this morning. So thank you very much for that. Okay, welcome back uh, to the second session of today's conference for the panel discussion. Um, for those, I think most of you know who I am by now, but I'm Helen Johnston, a social policy analyst um, at NESC, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce five speakers to give their reflections on the findings of the NESC welfare report and the Irish uh, social welfare system more generally. I'll give a brief introduction to each of the speakers before their inputs, and then we'll have a short question and answer session um, before lunch. First of all, I'd like to introduce Breed O'Brien, who is Head of Policy and Media at the Irish National Organization of the Unemployed, the INOU. Breed is one of the co community and voluntary pillar representatives on NESC and has considerable expertise on unemployment, social welfare and the labour market. Over to you, Breed. Great. Thanks very much, Helen, and thanks to Larry and, and NESC for, for this opportunity to participate this morning. Um, since the, um, the, the report was published, the INOU uh, ran two workshops on the report, just looking at the whole area of the future of the social welfare system. And um, we, we use that as the basis of the discussion. We had, we then explored five themes over the two, we had two events around this. We looked at issues around adequacy, delivery of social welfare service, genuinely seeking work, social insurance, and the interaction between work and the social welfare system. Our affiliates cover a whole range of issues. People work with people with disabilities, people unemployed, people who are parenting alone, people who are migrants. And so a range of issues came up over the two days, as you can well imagine. But I suppose what I would like to focus in on maybe today is just the, the issues that I think in particular affect people who are unemployed and arise around the issue of unemployment. Throughout the course of our work, I'm often struck how often it comes up, but people don't appreciate that access to a welfare payment is, can be both a right and an entitlement. There's a lot of stigma associated with being unemployed in particular. The complexity of the system, people are often not aware of their rights, they're aware of their entitlements and what they can access. This then leads to complications in terms of people progressing on, you know, if they are on a payment from welfare to work. Um, but in terms of just accessing the payment itself, that is something that really the state needs to work on, ensuring that people are aware of what they can do um, and can, you know, that what they have access to, what supports and services they have access to. One of the downsides of the Department of Social Protection taking over the public employment service was that a lot of access to services are now related to a payment. So if you don't have access to the payment, access to the services is limited. And that is an issue that we need to address as we move forward. To address the whole issue of participation of people of working age to be able to participate, that's absolutely critical. One of the ways of addressing the issues around participation income that was raised earlier would be that people who are of working age would like that type of support will be able to access it and been engaging with people on that. I welcomed Mary's remarks about community employment. It has its faults and failings, 
but it is an opportunity for many people to participate. A lot of community and voluntary sector organizations would not survive without it. And a lot of very important work is done in local communities. That work, unfortunately, is not recognized the way it should be in the wider labor market. And that is an issue that needs to be addressed as we go forward, that that type of work is acknowledged. Um, the issue of genuinely seeking work, it's been something that's been put on hold through the crisis, but it is an issue that raises concerns for many people. And in particular, so is the fact that people are, are, are under th th that provision are expected to be genuinely seeking full-time work. Now that may throw issues for people around their caring responsibilities, their family responsibilities. It can also throw up issues that may be in, in their circumstances part-time work may be the only type of work that they can avail of, that they can access. Picking up on points that were made by previous speakers, the access to decent work is critical. And I think that is an issue that we must really need to address, that we are ensuring we are supporting people to be able to access decent work. That a job in itself will not lead somebody out of poverty if the job in itself is poor or insecure, the income is uncertain, particularly when the cost of living in Ireland is so high. So they are issues that, 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 that need to be addressed. One of the things around the pandemic unemployment payment that has struck us, and this has been made by a previous speaker, that very much it appears to us that it was introduced partly to encourage people to stay at home, should they have the, uh, when, it was the when it was the illness benefit payment been enhanced, uh, so if you did, did indeed have COVID, then then that got rolled out as the pandemic unemployment payment. The level of support is welcome. However, it does has led to a, a situation where we do seem to have two rates of payment for people who are unemployed. And it's welcome to hear the government saying they will try and avoid the cliff edge come the end of June. But the reality is on the existing job seekers payments, there is a cliff edge. And a lot of people fell over that cliff in the 2008 crisis when they came to the end of their job seekers benefit payment and did not make the transition to the job seekers allowance payment the means test hasn't moved in many decades if your other half works they may not have an exciting job if you have some savings if you're a young person living at home your parents income is taken into account and so the existing system has lots of cliff edges to it it is a system with some very hard edges and a lot of people find themselves hitting those and, and hitting those hard. So the existing system is something that we need to look at because it is not as supportive of people as it should be and not as supportive of people over their working lives. So that is something that needs to be addressed. And I think the pandemic unemployment payment has highlighted the fact that when the state chooses to, it really can support people because as been already been highlighted, you know, just the, the fact that a young person, their parents' income isn't taken into account in the same household. If both partners have, are out of work because of the pandemic, they can both get a payment. So they are issues that that level of the system is more is less was more straightforward. It was easier for people to apply. Some of the, those the, that we need to carry forward as we go, go as we move forward. Similarly, the rate the rate was a big improvement. It's now, you know, there's now the four categories, but the least of those is the maximum you can be on on a job seekers payment. One of the things that happened in the last crisis was the duration on JB was cut by six months. That was never addressed. And we have had people contacting us who went on JB during the current crisis because they have family. And of course, they get to the end of that. And then when they've sought to make the transition to JA, then the rules and regs apply and people have found themselves on a considerably reduced payment. So again, we just need to be mindful of that, you know, in terms of if we are really to ensure that we're creating a, a, a system that is future proof, that will ensure it, people do not experience poverty, do not experience exclusion. And that those who need supports to be able to secure employment are given those supports, regardless of their eligibility for a payment. We, again, we just need to ensure that we are doing that. The department absorbed the public employment service now well over a decade ago. And we need to ensure it is indeed a public employment service that any member of the public of working age who wishes to secure advice and support to get a job or maybe move to a better job and needs that type of support and advice, that we are doing that so that people get that type and support advice over their lifetime. They can improve their economic prospects and can, can move forward in their lives. And that we address 
the significant economic inequalities that are here in, in Irish society. That is something that the report highlighted, and that was very welcome. There was also two other, I suppose, two parts of the report that we brought to people's attention were just the principles underpinning our existing system. Now, people have noted these sometimes these principles pull against each other, but again, I think maybe just useful to, to remind ourselves of them. They are adequacy, redistribution, contribution, solidarity, comprehensiveness, consistency, simplicity, equity, and sustainability. Sustainability is often used in terms of the system itself, but I think we also need to be thinking of it in terms of sustainability of the person and their family so that people really can see it as a system that is there to be supportive of them and to help them to secure their social and economic well-being. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Breed. And it's really useful to hear um, from the perspective of people who are in receipt and who are receipt of social welfare payments and who engage regularly with the system because that's where you can see how it really works or not. Um, and certainly it was useful to hear about access um, the need for decent work and the various cliff edges and so on that people um, uh, 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 come across as they move from payments to participation. So now I might want to move on to our second contributor, um, who is Ian Talbot. He's the Chief Executive of Chambers Ireland, which is Ireland's largest business network with 40 affiliated chambers nationwide. So we look forward to hearing Ian's input, in, input from a business perspective. Ian. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, and we're very time limited, so I'm really rang, ran exactly to time. So I'll get straight into the, the, the meat of this. Uh, as we were looking at this report, and as, as you asked, our reflections on the report, I was particularly keen to try and identify where we as employers are operating uh, on these tra trajectories for reform. Uh, the, the trajectories are the adequacy and alleviating poverty, modernizing family supports for gender and care needs, supporting high participation, enhancing financial stability, sustainability and implementation. So a little bit of background about who Chambers actually are. We represent 41 affiliated Chambers around the country. There are a lot of small Chambers that aren't affiliated. So anyone who uses our, our brand, uh, our common brand is affiliated, but the smaller ones tend to be volunteer led and not as active as the affiliated ones that we have who tend to have some critical mass and can really engage on policies around this. So we have about 10,000 members and a key thing about our organization is that we're geographically based, not sectorally based. So we're talking about things that matter from a geography perspective, all the infrastructure things that really matter, including workforce participation, education, and so on. We're also an all island organization. The uh, Chamber of Commerce in Northern Ireland are also members of ours as well. Uh, and that's an increasingly important relationship we have. Uh, we're also connected globally, and this is important in this area. We're connected to within Euro the European Union through an organization called Eurochambra. But in particular, we have a global organization called the International Chamber of Commerce. Um, not the most imaginative name, perhaps, but it does what it says in the tin. It's got members in over 100 countries. Um, and uh, one of the really remarkable things is that that organization is one of only 24 organizations that is full observer status at the United Nations. And I was on foot of that organization's willingness and desire back in the early uh, 2010s to engage with the developing sustainable development goals and really try and get business motivated behind those goals. So we've taken that on very much in the Irish Chamber Network um, back in it seems like only yesterday, and it was probably about the second last physical event we did, but in, in November 2019 with Mary Robinson, we launched a pledge where all our chambers around the country pledged to support and adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and we're trying to educate business on how best to use the goals and to really get over the message that there are 17 goals and you don't have to be contributing to all of them. You can contribute to the ones that you can deliver uh, something on. So in fact, at Chambers Ireland level, we, we picked five goals. They're gender equality, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. 
And everything we do now, if you look at any of our policy documents, pre-budget submissions, manifestos before the last election, for example, we outline all our recommendations on policy against the goals that they target rather than any in any traditional format where you used to see taxation and income tax and VAT and stuff. We outline what measures we're calling for against the goals themselves. So in terms then of specific things that we're, we're working on, um, first of all, putting place first is vital to us. Um, pairing balanced regional development with sustainable local economies is very important to us. And better places to live, work and do business across the whole country is very important to us. So some of the specific policy areas we're directly involved in are investment in affordable, excessive, uh, sorry, not excessive, quite the opposite, affordable, accessible quality childcare. It's really important to us, really important to the business community to facilitate people into the workforce. Um, things like auto enrollment and pensions <clears throat> is vital to us. We need to make sure that in terms of all the complexities we're going to have in funding social welfare in the future, that pension lagging isn't part of that. And pension poverty doesn't become part of that. Um, <clears throat> we're very strong on take up of paternity and parental leave. And again, that's part of our gender equality uh, basis, but it's to try and make a, a very good and quality environment for people to grow their families as well as their careers. Um, housing is another big issue for us around the country. Uh, I wish we had the, the absolute solution to housing. We keep prioritizing it. Um, and I, I, I feel we've so much in common working with people like Breed. There's so many areas we have in common. And on housing, um, you know, companies that give pay increases want to make sure that pay increase is going into quality of life, not into an increased rent for a landlord. And I also take up um, Breed's point very much. The cost of living in Ireland is very expensive. That makes it an expensive place to do business. And that's something we really need to focus on. In the area of healthcare, uh, it's really important for us now, particularly, it's always been important. And obviously a lot of companies, you know, contribute to things like VHI and, and so on for their for their uh, clients, but the 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 net uh, is really important for people that can't contribute to that. Mental health is going to be a big issue post pandemic as well. We know there's people out there who are employed and struggling, and there are people out there that don't know if they're employed or not and struggling. And hopefully, as we can get to reopen over the next few weeks, we'll start to find out and and really bottom out what the problem facing us actually is. Education is critical for business. Um, many of our chambers around the country are running skill nets. Um, and again, skill nets is a, a very diverse board. We're going to hear from Laura Bambrick uh, in a few minutes time. Laura's on the board of skill nets with me as well. Um, and that's again, a, you know, a growing organization, but again, geographic focused organization as well as sectoral and really making sure that we can give people the skills they need to be able to migrate into new jobs, the jobs that we don't know exist yet in the future, artificial intelligence and so on. We're also aware of things like the Commission on Tax and Welfare that's been established. We welcome that. And we welcome reform of the tax system as long as it continues to make sure that Irish companies are competitive. Uh, and also we're very strong on, on user pays. And we need to look at things, you know, a bit of a disappointment for our network, for example, has always been the property tax um, which really looks like a, it's not a tax on labour. Uh, it should be a very productive tax. It's kind of spent 10 years in a bit of a hole going nowhere. So we'd like to see you know, things like that properly addressed and people brought on board with the importance and relevance of the taxes they pay. Uh, we're also very concerned at the moment, uh, a point Breed raised as well, about people who are on the, the pop at the moment um, and how we can get them back into the workforce. What the tapering of these benefits that are really that have been really vital and really important but how we can get people back into the workforce while recognizing that for a lot of companies they're not going to be able to operate at full capacity for quite some time and also as, as Breed raised as well the difference between the old supports and the PUP and people who might have to go back to those old supports. Um, so you know all in all uh, there's lots of other things we're involved in where uh, for example this year we've been very vocal supporting the migrant rights campaign to regularize, regularize undocumented workers. Um, we've called for a Taoiseach led town first initiative to really drive town centre development as we come out of this crisis. Um, but I feel as I, as I look at the trajectories for reform, employers are doing a lot 
and we'd like to do more. And through our use of the Sustainable Development Goals, we're aiming to promote that work as much as we can. So thank you very much. And back to you, Alan. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. It's great to hear a mention of the Sustainable Development Goals and that they're informing your work. And um, the other thing I was struck by was in, in the list of kind of issues you, you saw as important, how many of them are, are actually supportive services, supportive services um, to support um, the income support system. And I think that's a kind of a message that uh, we want to try and get across and the importance of actually coordinating those um, in, in a very productive way uh, rather than having them disparate and uh, in their silos. So that's something Marcel talked about this morning as well. So that brings me on then to our third speaker in this panel session, um, who is Laura Bambrick, um, and she'll give a trade union perspective. Laura is head of social policy at the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, which is the umbrella body for 44 unions and is the largest civil society organization on the island of Ireland. Laura is responsible for advocating for a strong social safety net for workers and their families, and we're interested in hearing what she has to say. Laura. <clears throat> thank you, Helen, and uh, thank you to the Council for the invitation to give the trade union perspective. Um, I'd like to join others in welcoming the report and also welcoming the pertinent timing of today's conference as we exit lockdown and prepare to enter a new commission on uh, welfare. I don't know which is exciting me more. <laughs> um, so it's also pertinent time in, in that tomorrow is May Day, which is an important day in the trade union calendar where we celebrate the achievements of workers and their family, or work, workers and their unions, and we reflect on the challenges ahead. So Financial security for workers, whether in or out of work, has always been a key priority for the trade union movement. Long before the state itself took a role in income protection, trade unions were ensuring workers against loss of their ability to earn through unemployment, sickness, disability, old age, and providing access to medical treatment for workers and their families. Trade unions were integral to the development of modern welfare states uh, across Europe after the Second World War. And we continue today to have a strong positive effect on social protection expenditure. Um, the pandemic has caused the Irish Congress of Trade Union to ask the question that's posed by this report. Is our social welfare system fit for the future? Now, that's not to suggest that we had previously been blind to its inadequacies and the gaps. But like so many other people, we have tended to focus on parts of the system, pensions, family leave, sick pay, the high cost of healthcare, childcare, housing. And we didn't step back and to look at the uh, system in the round. Um, so, so, so we welcome the report for giving us this uh, opportunity. Um, I suppose, um, thankfully for the purposes of this conference, much of our thinking aligns with um, the, the, the recommendations and um, in this report, and its older sister, the 2005 Ness Report on the Developmental Welfare State, um, in that we believe that radical development of public services is the most important route to improving social protection. And in this, we're not alone. Observers of American politics will see that President Joe Biden and closer to home business representatives groups, Ian touched on it there themselves, they've been uh, focusing on greater investment in uh, social infrastructure, what trade unions more commonly refer to as the social wage, in that um, public services reduce the amount of out-of-pocket expenses and in a way acts as a virtual income, a so-called social wage. So as this report and previous work by Nesk have observed, Ireland differs to our wealthy, wealthy European peers 
in that we require workers to purchase goods and services um, that, uh, you know, e e even those that are just above a very low income, um, that workers in other European countries can avail of based on need and not ability to pay. So Congress believes that a shift to a more services welfare state, that is one that provides comprehensive and universal public services, not only will reduce reliance on wages and benefits to prevent and alleviate poverty and provide for adequate standards of living, it will go a distance to also help remove many of the employment and poverty traps that are embedded in our current transfer heavy uh, welfare system, as well as helping address many of the barriers people with a disability and others in our high numbers of jobless households uh, face in accessing employment, which in turn contributes to our high levels of uh, market income inequality. So the other key uh, income adequacy issue for the future, the council and, and this report believes, is whether we should move to a European model of social insurance. Now, again, Ireland is different to our wealthier peers in that income supports here, as Breed has mentioned, they're ungenerous, they're flat rated, they're really designed just to offer recipients no more than minimal protection against destitution. For example, job seekers benefit is worth less than a quarter of the average full time wage and is priced below the poverty line. In comparison, EU welfare states have earning replacement ratios between 50 and 80 percent of previous earnings, albeit, you know, just for a time limited period. With the arrival of COVID, all that change changed utterly. Um, the emergency income protection and the wage insurance response from government involved a pivot to payment rates that have been linked to prior earnings. Protection of jobs and wages, the economic continuity, the living standards and the social security this secured trumped all considerations that heretofore had prevailed. And it's a Congress priority is to make permanent this temporary shift. We recognize that this will have to be done alongside more flexi security to ensure a just transition for displaced workers and a higher social floor for people outside of the labor market. So how do we get there? How do we pay for European style benefits and payments? After all, this is the other area of consideration for the new commission. Analysis carried out by the Nevin Economic Institute shows that Ireland has the lowest level of per person public spending compared to similar wealthy European member states. Not only have we the lowest level of public spending, we also have the lowest level of government revenue per person. Most notably, we collect substantially less in social contributions than what is typical amongst our peers. In other words, it's possible to raise the revenue needed to significantly increase public spending without increase in taxes to levels in excess of the European norms. So this is not to say that Congress is, um, that, 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 that we don't acknowledge that the pandemic will leave us poorer as a nation and will make radical reform of income protection a harder sell. But well, many people have had a wake up moment now and they realize the importance of a, so, uh, a robust social welfare system, which is opening up a space to mobilize support for new approaches. After all, the modern welfare systems were built out of the ruins of, the war, of World War II and people haven't had a common experience of an event such as the pandemic. So I'm finishing, I'll just conclude and say that uh, Congress thanks NESC for this report. It's a very valuable res resource and it will go a distance to framing the debate on our post-pandemic welfare state. Thanks, Helen. 
Okay, thanks very much, um, Laura. Um, it's really helpful to have the important role of the trade unions in the social welfare outlined again. A strong focus, I think, on services um, as part of the overall all system. And then um, uh, you touched obviously on the importance of income adequacy um, and the reference to the flex security system, which we haven't talked much about today. And then the financing. So the adequacy and financing uh, issues will certainly be picked up in the workshops this afternoon, we can have a good discussion around those issues. So thanks very much. So now we move on to an academic perspective and we have an input from uh, Sean O'Rean. Sean is a professor of sociology at the University of Maynooth and he has research interests in the sociology of work and employment, inequality and social change. Um, Sean was a member of the Nest Council from 2011 to 2017. So over to you, Sean. Thanks very much, Helen, and, and thanks for the chance to, to uh, speak with everybody today. And congratulations on uh, another excellent report from, from NESC. Uh, I really appreciated the, the combination of kind of a clear core argument, which I took to be using uh, basically more emphasis on using social insurance to support a kind of more comprehensive, effective uh, set of public services, but then combining that with a kind of a rich detail, which you know, empirical, but also just even the ideas and the mechanisms, because I think that just, I'll come back to this at the end, gives you some political possibilities to kind of uh, play with. But uh, I suppose I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, most of my remarks really around the, the idea in the report that um, you're seeking to underpin social welfare with employment and economic policies that do not generate unduly high market income dis disparities. And, and we know we have a very high uh, uh, levels of market income inequality with, as the report mentions, the social welfare uh, system doing a lot of work to break down, uh, break, you know, so to compensate for that. I suppose the key point I want to make is that behind those high market income inequalities, there's very complex interactions between the welfare system and in particular elements like enterprise policy and employment policy and industrial relations. So I just wanted to talk about two or three places where those intersect and in a way, to, it, it, I suppose it links back into Mary Daly's point earlier that, you know, how do we think about what's required, um, not outside the, the welfare system, but in interaction with us to make uh, a vision like this to this work. So just a couple of very brief kind of intersections, uh, wave my hands wildly at some examples. So one is that the kind of low wage labor market in, in Ireland, the, the most probably adjacent to the welfare system. And I mean, that is a low wage labor market, but it is also compared to other countries, a kind of a weak labor market. Uh, it doesn't really provide us with many ladders and a lot of employers are quite uh, you know, small. Some are, are, are very um, low in profitability or others are, are more profitable. Some, their, their property is in a way the main asset of the business rather than uh, you know, a developmental uh, enterprise. So, so you have that on the enterprise side, you have over the years, the welfare system has in a way been designed to support that model. Low tax wage, uh, some cross subsidy of wages by, by welfare uh, payments and so on. And then you have firms that, uh, you know, relative workers are getting relatively poor when you look at the survey data compared to other countries, relatively um, low learning on the job, less access to training and so on. And that's not surprising if you have really small uh, companies. And, but it also links back to our own enterprise policy, which is not focused on developing those kinds of micro enterprises. Uh, we, we work more on it in recent years, but um, in any case, with the basic and the other overarching point is the areas where we have weak services like childcare, for example, uh, is a huge issue for those firms. So, uh, so just to take that example, um, and I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna run out of time. I thought, but um, you can see there that enterprise policy, you know, employment and industrial relations conditions, and the welfare system interact in a whole set of ways. That um, you know, I mean, I suppose we could go into the details, but that would impact the kinds of uh, factors that that you discuss in the you know ensuring high participation chapter. So you know, elements like the the, the level of welfare payments. Um, and the, the participation income would, would interact with the nature of the firms that are dealing with this and so on. So 
so so that's one po point to make the other is just when you look at the other end so so um if you look at the there's a threat i think at the top end of the income inequalities which is that typically and historically our welfare system has partly worked by I shouldn't say worked, but the way it has functioned has been that, you know, if you have higher incomes, you use the, that income to uh, supplement the public services that you also access. So private schools, et cetera, et cetera, uh, private health insurance, and not just private health insurance, just direct payment for, for health privately, which is, which is very high. So, you know, you might say that that's what's the problem. The problem is that it creates a corrosive effect on provision. When you feed back into the system, you end up with all kinds of strange cross subsidies that we're very familiar with from health. But you know, you also end up with these kind of um, slightly fictional elite providers. You know, private hospitals, certain universities, you know, private schools, etc., uh, which in a sense has this kind of corrosive effect on the services. So, in a sense, the key there is not is to kind of protect the service system. And actually, I see a huge potential for social insurance there because it can link income to services, but not in, 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 a, way, but in a way that enhances the overall um, provision of services. Uh, I started off with nothing. To, I think in yesterday that I had nothing to say. And by the time I got to this, to, to this point, I feel like I could go on forever. The, so, uh, but I suppose my key point is that we need to think about ways that these that we can address these intersections of the kinds of uh, measures and the overall approach that's in the report with uh, employment, industrial relations and enterprise policy in particular, but then that links across to, uh, you know, uh, care uh, and education uh, and indeed healthcare. Uh, and I suppose the key thing I want to say there, and I see it in my day job, uh, which is where I'm a head of an academic department, which really means basically working with students all the time to deal with their various complex issues. And the model that works in a way is empowering the people who are working directly with the, with the citizens to access a very complex suite of tools and supports that they have available to them. And I have to say the satisfying thing about doing the job I'm doing at Maynooth is that we have a kind of complex suite. So you have your 10 or 12 people that you call, you put together that suite for, for the, um, uh, for uh, the citizens, in this case, the students involved. And I think we need to think about a system that can draw on that across, not just the welfare system, but also into linking up with the uh, enterprise part, the local councils, etc. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I've already run over. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. And again, this is a recurring theme today, I think, the uh, integration of different service provisions and different uh, social welfare. And, and you've cast the net a little bit wider there, I think, um, into other policy areas as well. Um, and it's you know, a very strong focus as well on income inequalities uh, with people at the, at the uh, lower levels of income and what's required for them, but then also um, the kind of high service, the, the buying of private services for people on higher incomes and how that undermines the system. So I'm sure we'll pick these things up um, in the question and uh, answer session following on from this. Um, and so that brings me then to our final speaker in this session, um, and that is Ronan Hessian. Uh, Ronan is an assistant secretary in the Department of Social Protection, and he leads policy across a, diver a diverse range of areas, including working age income support policy. We've worked closely with uh, Ronan and his colleagues throughout this work on the Irish social welfare system, and we look forward to his contribution today. Ronan. Thanks very much, Helen, and, and my thanks, and the department's thanks to NESC for the great work done on not only the, the report that's been discussed today, but also the constituent reports. It's a huge reservoir of insight and analysis that benefits from multiple perspectives. Uh, and the work, as I said earlier, the work was uh, requested by the department, we wanted NESC to challenge us. We wanted to look strategically at the system. Uh, and I think what, what's come back has been extremely uh, rich and uh, incredibly timely as well. And we think that we're, you know, hopefully now emerging from uh, the pandemic. We also have the Commission on Tax and Welfare, which I know the NESC report will feed into. We have the Commission on Pensions, as the minister said, which will report by the summer. We're also looking at the successor to Pathways to Work, 
the you know the national economic recovery plan has been examined across government and we're looking at implementation of the roadmap for social inclusion so there's an awful lot of deep thinking going on about the system and a lot of forward looking so that the, the work couldn't come at a better time it's a great resource i think i think from our point of view we work to a number of different cycles we work to the the political policy cycle and the parliamentary cycle we work to the media cycle uh, we also work to the budgetary cycle. So every year we engage closely, and all year, in fact, we engage with stakeholders about what improvements can be made to the system, uh, where are the dissonances, where are the mismatches, because after all, the system itself is a, is a patchwork. It's a sort of, it's a bedrock, but it's a sort of sedimentary rock. It's been built up layer by layer, year by year, uh, incrementally, where last year's decisions are tweaked and improved upon. The real benefit of this exercise is, is the strategic focus. I'll just say a little bit what I mean by that. I often think in, in our jobs, we are used to sort of 360 feedback where our managers, our peers, uh, the people who work in our teams give feedback on whether we're any good at our jobs. I often think the person best placed to evaluate that is the person who does your job after you. Uh, and I think to some extent, as a department, when I look at my management board colleagues and collectively in one way of looking at it, we are sort of the custodians of the welfare state. I, I really have great respect for the foresight and the ambition and the vision of the people who've gone before, not just departmentally or politically, but the wider stakeholders and all the people who shaped the system that we now have. Uh, we need to think about what are going to be the needs of this century. And we know that, the, uh, that when we come to strategic questions, they are the questions that will not go away. So governments will change, uh, departments will be restructured, we'll all have different priorities, every organization participating here will have changing priorities, but the questions, the strategic questions are the ones that keep coming back until you deal with them. Now I say deal with them, to some extent there's a spectrum here. Uh, ideally you solve a problem. If you can't solve it, try and make things better. If you can't make it better, try and stop it getting worse. And if you can't stop it getting worse, at least keep the thinking pointed in the right direction. So none of these are easy. Uh, none of these uh, are isolated issues. They're part of uh, a, a whole that goes beyond the social welfare system and the service provision across government and private sector as well, of course. I think there's there are a couple of points looking at the strategic point, I think. First of all, the world of work is clearly changing. Uh, it's getting more complex. Uh, in terms of whether it's platform work, whether it's people across their careers having periods of part-time work, periods of unemployment, periods of full-time employment, combining self-employment with employment. Uh, and we need, clearly need to make sure that our system is fit for that. It, the, the world of work is not going to change to suit the social welfare system. So we need to try and recognize the reality of what's happening. Secondly, I think clearly there's the issue around the, the demographics. I think people are pretty well uh, tuned in to the implications that has for pension and the Pensions Commission, of course, is looking at the sustainability there. There are other ways in which that affects the social welfare system. If you look particularly at the, the trend for payments on illness, disability and caring, they've gone up significantly, uh, over 30% in the last five years. Numbers uh, are increasing significantly on those, and that does reflect the change in demographics. So it's not just it's not just a pensions issue. The other thing is about the complexity of family for formation, both uh, in, from the point of view of um, the uh, the way in which we support families, uh, the way in which we support children, the way in which we support people when families break down. But we we shouldn't forget the uh, position of people who don't have children and single people, one of the issues that's come up from various stakeholder groups uh, and it's flagged in the NEST report is the, the vulnerability to poverty of those who uh, do not have children and who find themselves uh, perhaps getting less talked about and less of a priority. Um, just talking a little bit about the experience of the pandemic and the PUP, a very interesting experiment and it's been, it's been referenced here. So I'll just touch on a few things. One thing about PUP is it's very simple. And when you look at some of the, the the, the, the ideas that are coming out of the NEST report, it's interesting to sort of see, to tick off, have a sort of bingo card of NEST words and PUP words to see what's the level of overlap. It, it is a simple payment. It's quick. You apply today, you get paid tomorrow. 
um, it's not over 90% online. At the same time, it's possible to have such a simple system because we didn't get rid of the rest of the social welfare system. We still had a 20 billion euro plus system full of complexity and nuance uh, that ran alongside pub. So it's important to remember that. It's also, as Mary mentioned earlier on, it is a temporary payment. In fact, originally it was for six weeks, then 12 weeks, then into August, then it's been extended since then. And I think just to emphasize again what the minister has said, Taoiseach has said, and other ministers have said, that the government is, is clear that there'll be no cliff edge in terms of what the picture will be as we emerge from the pandemic. The other thing is, is pay related. Uh, I think Laura mentioned that. Of course, jo job seekers benefit and illness benefit are both pay related as well. Although in reality, the vast majority of people are, are on the top rate. But the fact that it's pay related and th there, are, there are commitments in the programme for government to examine uh, the issue of pay related benefits and associated PRSI implications. It is individualised, which is a big theme coming out of the NESC report. Although the 350 rate was adopted to reflect more or less the cost of a two adult household. Um, so it is individualized, but it was pitched at a level to cover um, a two-person two payment. I think one thing that's important and probably one of the most innovative, though not necessarily talked about that much aspects of PUP, is that it uses real-time information, using real-time revenue information rather than the governing contribution year. Um, it's not uh, the simplicity uh, doesn't quite translate to the self-employed. Because of the time lag in reporting self-employed uh, income, uh, it's a little trickier, especially when a person combines self-employment with employment. Uh, there are five different calculations that have to be done. So, so what we see um, about the argument for, for simplicity is that that's fine so long as you also can deal with the exceptions and the margins. A couple of points I want to make before I finish because time is tight. One is on sustainability. I'd like to just make the point that there's a link between sustainability and certainty. Uh, a sustainable system can ride the, the economic cycle up and down. An unsustainable one can't. I mean, you're dealing with uh, marginalized people, and people who are vulnerable to poverty. It's very important that there aren't income shocks. The second one is about participation. We know that poverty rates are linked, uh, quite heavily correlated to participation in employment. So it's very important that we encourage participation, particularly in groups uh, such as low parents, people with disabilities, who are also at risk of poverty. Uh, and I think two final points. One is that the issue of values is, is brought out in the NESC report. There is a sort of societal conversation about what the right balance is between uh, the entitlements provided to the system and the, the people who pay for it. Because although it's not paid for by the department, we, we only pay the money that's given to us by the taxpayer. The final thing I'll say is that strategic questions involve choices. So not just adding new things, or we can all think of ways to build a system, expand the system, do new things, have new fill gaps. But if you're, if, you're not, if you're not making choices, then now you're really addressing something strategically. What is the system going to do at the expense of other things? And it was very interesting to pre the forum two years ago. We, we talked to a wide range of groups and it was a surprising bit of consensus about the need to, to focus on lone parents even from groups who are not necessarily representing that cohort. So it's interesting, we've seen that conversation, the recognition that there are choices, there are trade-offs and there are priorities. So I think when it comes to strategic questions, when we talk about when this hits the political world, that's where things get very complex because you have to say, these, are, these might be all very good ideas, but which are the ones that are going to fundamentally uh, equip the social welfare system for the challenges of the 21st century? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronan. A very comprehensive overview there. Um, of, of some of the, uh, the challenges, how the system works, um, you know, the, uh, the, the POP has an interesting kind of concept of the, of the bingo card, um, comparing an ESC to that. And, and you're quite right, a lot of the, the things that we say um, are there in the POP, um, but of course it is, as you say, supported by the existing system uh, and underneath it. So we haven't transitioned from one to the other and then flagging the values as well, it should underpin the system, and that's maybe a bigger discussion for another day. So we've got 10 or 15 minutes now um, for questions and discussions. Um, at the first question I'm going to put to Sean, because it was directly posed to you, Sean, if that's okay. 
Um, is here that there are knock-on effects between wage growth and increased living costs. So how could efforts to grow the domestic economy and increase productivity help to manage government expenditure and reduce the costs of social welfare supports? So if you want to take that one. Yeah, um, it's just a <laughs> big question. Um, yeah. I, I think... Well, I, I suppose to go back to the first point I would say is, uh, and, and I suppose this, this picks up on what Ronan said about values there, but go back to Laura's point is that there is, you know, compared to other countries, there's definitely a, a lot of uh, kind of headroom for us to, to go to taxation norms around Europe, for example. Um, but in a way, the, the politics of that to me is always, you know, you need to be getting wins as you as you increase the taxes you know otherwise i mean that's just the politics of it so there's, there's a kind of a it takes a, a political creativity there as well but the other side of it is like i think these are mutually so if you can solve that political dilemma like these are mutually supportive ideas the idea that you have better services that really are kind of supportive services as well as protective payments um that those are massive kind of uh, subsidies in the best possible sense to enterprises. Um, you know, I just think of small, small micro firms and maternity leave was a classic example to me. If you had a, you know, a, a proper centrally funded model of that, uh, you know, your micro enterprise um, would find it much easier to support people through the life cycle and so on. So, so, um, and yes, you know, the rep a lot of the representative groups for smaller firms would be, uh, you know, aren't aren't leading the charge on, on issues like that. So, so I think there is a kind of a, a um, kind of a virtuous cir circle that you can generate um, politically that you know is around uh, services, and that is is a fundamental element of actually um, kind of supporting enterprises, also especially more productive enterprises. And kind of fixing your political, like making the political dynamic work, also. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sean. And um, there's a number of points that have come into the chat about the adequacy of payments, and with some reference as well to the work that the Vincentian Partnership um, has has done around um, a minimal minimum essential standard of living. I know we'll be discussing this in more detail in a workshop in the afternoon, but maybe just to uh, go to each of the speakers um, to get their views on what, how they think adequacy um, really should be pitched um, in the social welfare system. So maybe we'll come to you, Breed. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Helen. You know, for us very much, the welfare system needs to address the issue of poverty. And so that we would support the work of the Vincentian Partnership for Social Justice on the rollout of the minimum essential standard of living. Um, so that for us, there's two bars to this, that the payment would lift people above the poverty line and support people to move towards meeting a minimum essential standard of living. Okay, thank you. Ian, do you have a contribution on that? Um, you're on mute. The Zoom call. Yeah, okay, there, I'm freed up now. Um, yeah, I suppose there's... there's it's such a complex question. There, there's adequacy, there's affordability. Um, you know, the thing we'd like to focus on is economic growth to deliver jobs for everybody and decent work um, so that the, the pressure is taken off the system and we can make sure that we get adequate payments to the people who need them um, and the system just isn't swamped with, with sheer volume. So, you know, from an employer's perspective, it's generating jobs and and decent work is a, is a critical component of this. And, you know, most employers are, are in business to, you know, grow and develop their businesses. So that's, that's what we do. Okay, another question has just come in and it's kind of related to this. So I'm, I'm going to put that to, to the remaining panelists here and that's around, um, do judgments of deserving and undeserving uh, come into play around the uh, adequacy? Um, including in relation to the pop. So maybe Laura, you want to pick that one up? Thanks, Helen. I, I suppose what I find interesting about um, 
or notable about conversations about welfare rate advocacy in the Irish context is they almost exclusively relate to welfare rates keeping people out of poverty. And I guess that's understandable because with the exception of the contributory uh, old age pension, they're all priced below the poverty line. But there is a complete absence of conversation about adequacy of welfare rates to protect living standards. And I suppose in my uh, brief remarks, that was one of the points that I was trying to get across that in a way that's what the PUP payment and the um, wage subsidy did. It was trying to make that, it, it, it was making that connection between the welfare rate and the previous income, albeit the, the, the the wage cap was, uh, or the, the income cap was pretty low. It was 410 maximum. Um, so um, I think that's where the debate, and certainly the Irish Congress of Trade Union thinks that that's where the debate needs to be about adequacy to protect uh, income standards when there's an interruption in earnings, not just about that there's a decent social floor that nobody should fall, fall below. And I think that will remove the difference between the deserving and non-deserving. I, th I think that could build up um, more uh, social solidarity and uh, social buy-in into the system, which we're going to need if we're going to look at increase in taxation and especially social insurance taxation when it's going to be seen in the pay packet. Okay, thanks very much. And I'll come then to Ronan on that because you've already had a question, Sean, if that's okay. Um, and I know the department have done some work around this anyway. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's been, there's been an ongoing sort of discussion about the role of the MESL and also, as you know, the Low Pay Commission looking at the issue of, of the living wage and about to what extent uh, people are supported uh, to stay at a sort of baseline level uh, that they can support themselves. And of course, in social welfare, I think just when we talk about social welfare rates and, and, and payments, you know, people often can access to multiple types of payments and combine them at work. So it's quite, it can be quite a complex picture. Um, the question of deserving and undeserving, and in fairness to the, I didn't see who did the question, but in fairness to the question, they did put it in inver inverted commas. So I don't think it, it uh, recognizes the sort of sensitivity of it. I think what, what we're looking at now, um, the experience, you know, there, as I, there's a number of pieces of work that are looking at the issue of adequacy, whether it's the Commission on Taxation and Welfare uh, and you know, the, the Commission on Pensions, there isn't a, a simple one-size-suits-all one answer. In fact, what we see uh, is that when you try to design a social welfare system, you can look at adequacy, you can look at simplicity, and but what happens very quickly is that on the margins of that, you will find that certain groups are not accommodated for, and then you bring in complexity. Uh, so I don't think there is, yeah, I, I don't have a nutshell answer to the issue of adequacy. Obviously, we look at, at this in a, in a budgetary context, we are there uh, as a department to advise government in the context of a much broader discussion. I think emerging from, if you look at the programme for government, there are commitments there to examine whether benefits can be enhanced and whether PRSI needs to change to reflect that. Um, but the environment we're in at the moment, uh, and I'm sure... Ian, it would probably point out, you know, when you have the various different uh, stresses that employers are under, whether it's in the form of, um, you know, Brexit, you know, trying to get back to business and other initiatives, there's, there's a quite a complex balancing trick uh, the government has to pull off there. So uh, I, I don't think the adequacy question is, it can really be answered in isolation from how that's to be funded. And again, we go back to my point, what are the choices? Are we prioritising adequacy? Are we prioritising? Are, are we going to say to the social welfare system, we have 20 odd billion euro a year, let's just get rid of poverty? Are, are, we, are we societally and across the system, you know, unanimous in that? Because that would, that would involve changes to the system, whether it's through tax or social welfare to address that. Okay, so we thank you very much for that. That brings us neatly really to the last question I just want to pose to the panellists. Um, for a very quick answer, and it's the same as the question that was posed at the end of the last system, the last session. Um, if you had to give one piece of advice to the Commission on Tax and Welfare, what would it be? Um, mm -hmm. So I'll go back to you, Sean. You 
Um, uh, if I have to give one piece of advice to the Commission. Um, uh, I, I think that really it, it's about, it's a, it, it actually relates to this question of adequacy as well, because at the end of the, the day, um, we kind of need to move our ambition from, you know, we're a poor country that needs to protect people to being that we're now a wealthy country that needs to be developing the whole kind of population. Okay. Sense. And so you're talking about tax and, tax and welfare that enables people to make the investments as households that um, will, in, you know, in kind of enable, uh, you know, educational progression and so on. So I, I, I suppose I, I would like to see it organized that uh, it enables the state to make available a suite of supports to, to all households and that that be the, the primary kind of uh, focus and that and that and that will have huge effects um, around poverty. Thank you, uh, Laura. Um, I think if I was being pragmatic, I'd suggest that they look for an extension. I think they've been given uh, just under a year to, before they have to report. Um, there is, as uh, previous speakers have mentioned, a lot of moving parts happening at the moment. We have a commitment to introduce statutory sick pay. We have a commitment to introduce uh, quasi-mandatory occupational pensions. Um, we have commitments to look at pay-related um, pay related um, unemployment benefit, job seekers uh, benefit. So um, I, I think not to lose, not to get lost in the detail and try to keep, keep an eye on the moving parts, if, if that's possible. Hey, thank you. Ronan? Um, well, I suppose I better be careful, but what, what I would say is uh, I think the interplay I think I think it would be a missed opportunity if 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 they had two columns of recommendations, one about tax and one about social welfare. I think the interplay between the two systems uh, and the way in which that influences people's ability to 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 work, to be able to support themselves in the labour market. I think the interplay between tax and social welfare is critical, and I and I hope that it isn't tax and social welfare as two separate modules, that it's the actual interplay between those two, the interconnection between those two. Very interesting, one thing we haven't really talked that much about is the EWSS. You know, quite, I think, a really innovative scheme in terms of keeping the connection with employers, in terms of the way it's administered, you know, and, and the way it's run. So I think things that are worth paying attention to, the way that it's in problem solving mode, rather than, what, rather than being too hung up on which system does what. Mm. Okay, thank you, that's helpful, Ian. Um, first of all, just to, to say Ron made some great points there, not that everyone else didn't either, but that interplay I think is really important. Um, the wage subsidy, the EWSS and, and its predecessors, that, that ability to stay in touch, but there is still this tapering off issue because that's when we find out the companies that actually don't exist any longer, but they're their staff are just being paid on the wage subsidy scheme. Can they get back up and running? But the point I'm going to make is more on the, the tax side than on the welfare side. And I, I still think it, it, there's a social dimension here to taxpayers and their understanding of what their taxes get used for. And every time we try to broaden the tax base, there's just a flurry of opposition to it. And, you know, quietly then it slips away and, you know, we don't get that benefit of it. Um, I think, as we've seen in the last year, we've seen the extraordinary amount of work, for example, that local government has put in to making all our local areas as good as they can possibly make them. That, there's a bill for that, and yet nobody wants to recognise that local government needs to be well and properly funded, for example. So it's getting people to understand the taxes are, it's that link between the payment of tax and the provision of services. And if they can do anything to make recommendations on how we can get our taxpayers to feel that they should and should welcome the opportunity to pay more tax for the service they're getting, I think is a, is a really key psychological message to help implement reforms that we need to make. And it's all about implementation. We can write all the reports we want. I think it's, it's one of the points that we actually have in the tra trajectories is how are we going to implement this? Okay, and it was a point brought up very strongly by Marcelo this morning as well. Mm. Okay, and Breed. Indeed, yes. <laughs> I, I think it, it's, it's a commission that could get very bogged down in the technicalities of two complex systems. 
So how then do we ensure that they kind of, I suppose, take that step back to look at the, 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 the picture in its, in, in its entirety and ensure that we develop a tax and social welfare system that will be supportive of people, that will ensure nobody is living in poverty, that we have income to provide the services we need to provide to ensure people can participate fully in our society and our, our, and our economy. And then how then do we ensure then, as, as Ina said, that everybody buys into that, that people appreciate this is what these systems should be doing and that if we all work together on it, we could create systems that could make a very big difference to people and ensure that we address some of the structural inequalities that we seem to face year in, year out and which ish, issues and challenges like COVID have, have exacerbated and highlighted. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you all. So I, I now want to bring this session to a close. Um, I'd like to thank very sincerely all our panelists, Breed, Ian, Laura, Sean, and Ronan, uh, for the very thoughtful inputs and for responding then to the questions. I think we've had a, a great morning of contributions and discussion um, on the future of the Irish social welfare system. So now we're going to take a lunch break and then I'd ask uh, for you all to return promptly at 13.30, 1.30, when you'll be then directed to your selected thematic discussion session. So you have to come back into the plenary and then you'll be uh, allocated uh, to your various discussion workshops. So enjoy your lunch break and I'll see you after lunch. Bye. Thanks. Okay, uh, look, very late in the day, people have... People have listened to a lot of very interesting presentations and have sat patiently through some very interesting comments and so on. And, and it's, my, it's my task to, uh, to try and offer some summary remarks. I should confess to the fact straight away that I was tempted last night in preparing for today to actually sit down and make out some bullet points by way of, by way of summation before having heard anything people might have to say. Now, that temptation was very strong indeed, I have to say. I'm glad I didn't give in to temptation because it's actually proved to be a very interesting day. And what, I, what I'm saying now would be, uh, is actually, I hope, reflective of what I learned and heard during the day. And I'm trying, so to speak, to respond on my feet to, some, to, to, to the diverse material we've heard. Now, I might speak maybe for about 10 or 15 minutes. I certainly won't detain you for another half hour because Larry wants to close proceedings. Um, I'll just, uh, I have about four or five broad points I want to make and I'll, I'll try and take you through these. Uh, forgive any hesitancy on my part because I'm, I'm, I'm speaking ad hoc and some of what I'm reflect uh, arises from just the very last few comments we had in our, in our breakout session. I had the, I was involved, I, participated in the one on financing. So we could have had a summary set of remarks about that session alone. So look, I'll try, I'll try and capture as best I can the flavor of what came out for me, at least during the day. So please bear with me. I, I mean, the first, the first kind of uh, set of remarks that occurred to me are broadly speaking about what I will, for want of a better term, call context. And needless to say, uh, the, the, the shadow over the day, indeed over the report is COVID-19. And I think every single contributor in some way or another alluded to this. Um, I, and I think the, maybe the most vivid uh, remark in that vein came from, uh, from Laura Bambrick, who was speaking on behalf of Congress, who used the phrase, COVID-19 was a wake-up call. And indeed it was, in, in this sense, that it, at the level of, at the narrow level of, of uh, the structure and the, and the, and the design of, of, of social welfare, the public, and the service providers and policymakers and so on are now a good deal more aware of very specific features of the social welfare system, the importance of means tests, the lack of individual rights, the level of the payments and so on. And all of those kind of things came out very vividly in, in, in people's experiences of, of, of the system. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that these wider weaknesses revealed by the COVID context extend, of course, way beyond the narrow remit of social welfare to uh, the reliance on private nursing homes, the prevalence of private care, the, uh, the, uh, the importance of uh, uh, private rented costs and so on. So 
if we if we if we needed a wake up call to remind us of the fragmentation of our of our of our welfare system broadly defined, we've 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 just had it. Uh, and it was, I was quite heartened by the fact that the Congress of Trade Unions is, has, in a sense, thrown down the gauntlet and, and is, is, de is determined to, to, uh, to, to propagate those weaknesses and to use them as a, as, as a point for, for change in the, in the future. The second bit of Conti's room uh, was, came to mind when Sean O'Rean, amongst others, reminded us very much of the the wider political economy, labour market, employment context to which the welfare system is embedded. And of course, we're all familiar with the fact that, uh, you know, amongst the wider changes the report is meant to address is the, the, the rise of precarious employment, the incidence of low pay and so on, all of which, too, of course, Sean went beyond that, of course, and reminded us that, that it's not just that we have an incident of low pay, that there's, uh, we have a, what, he, what, he, what I think he termed was uh, a weak, labour market. That's to say, it's not just low pay at any given point in time, but lack of career structures, poor employment conditions, employers themselves with low skills and very little assets, low level of investment and so on. Uh, and it's almost as if, if I could coin a phrase, there's a sort of a dual economy there between one sector, uh, one uh, high value added exporting sector of the economy and the other, the domestic economy, and, uh, relying a lot on part time low paid labour and so on. But, but there's a as was the, the interesting point that Sean made was that you could almost see the welfare system, quotation marks, almost in the sense as a, some of it at least, as an implicit subsidy to that sector of the economy. We're using workers on, 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 the, on, the, on the worker family payment, part-time employees who were signing on, working in the digital economy and the service sector and so on. And it would be interesting, Sean posed the question, to which I don't have an answer, I have to confess, but can we find a way both analytically and politically, of uh, creating some kind of virtuous circle there between, rather than a, rather than a vicious virtuous circle between uh, that that type that part of the economy and the welfare system more widely. Uh, the third issue of context was, of course, the the part of the context that was stressed very much by by the stressed very much in this report, and of course reflects the developmental welfare state perspective, which is the need to embed the income support system in, in, in an infrastructure of high quality public services on a, on a, if not a universal, then on a comprehensive basis. And uh, there was a, a, an interesting contribution from Mary O'Daly, I thought, who, who confronted the developmental welfare state model and, and suggesting that perhaps we were relying too much in our in our analysis and so on in our debate today on that kind of de developmental welfare state premise. I mean, to begin with, she she suggests that they, it relies too much on the labour market, relies too much on uh, even good quality activation, and I think had a fairly blunt conclusion that the labour market doesn't deliver in terms of protection and welfare. I mean, a fairly pungent conclusion, I think, uh, which which I think we we need to reflect on. That, that said, I, the, the second point Mary made was that the danger of emphasizing high quality, broadly university provided social services, what she called the Matthew effect, namely that people in higher income groups will benefit more from these services and so on, which is not quite the thing. I found myself disagreeing with Mary in this sense and that part of the response to that lay in what Mary herself said. Namely, that you can have uh, a broad framework of universal provision on the one hand, but with, for want of a better term, and this is my term, not hers, some degree of, let's call it, tailored universalism to, to, uh, to, to address anti-poverty and social exclusion issues at the same time. And indeed, we have a very good example of that. You could make the case, for example, that a very popular universal service is primary education. It works well, it's broadly accessible, uh, there's no economic barriers to entry, the services are popular by all children and families, and the evidence is there from the growing up in an Ireland survey, so that if you like, this universal service works rather well. And yet we've been able to graft on top of that degree of universality a system of differentiated provision for schools in different areas and so on. So we're, we're, we're learning the art, if you like, of responding to what Mary called the called the, uh, the Matthew effect, which I, which I say I take a point, want to make a point of, of disagreement. It may very well be the case, of course, that the, the more 
the weakness, for want of a better term, of the development of wait for settlement is more the political challenge it poses. Namely, it goes right to the heart of the underlying character of the welfare state, a lack of universality in public provision, and, uh, and convincing a wider public of the link between higher taxes and better services is, is really not so much an analytical problem as a, as a political one. The second set of remarks I'd like to make, uh, about which quite a lot was said today, was, uh, if I can use this word loosely, the model of income support provision the report advocates and the, the are the models and the other models that the report alludes to and as you're all familiar with now of course that the model the, the report uh points in particular at the weakness of our so-called social insurance system invokes the idea of european models as something that perhaps we should we should grasp and so on um and i think during the day, I, I think the point that was made was this, that that, 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 that direction points to some quite specific uh, policy challenges. And, 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 and in particular, the rather singular, narrow system of social insurance you have with one fund, with a low employer rate and a low employee rate and so on, um, weakens the claim we can make to, to the current system being social insurance. And yet at the same time, uh, we're, we're aware of the advantages of having uh, higher levels of contributions for sustainability reasons. Uh, higher levels of contributions would justify income-related structures, benefits, which would address poverty and so on. So I think that's I, I think that that's kind of at the heart of the income support question in the report, uh, whether we move in that direction or not. And it does raise quite important implications. Now, needless to say basic income came up, it couldn't. This is the idea that simply will not die, partly thanks to Anne-Marie and Helen and other people who are, who have quite, who have quite, quite um, uh, well-informed, uh, uh, positive orientation towards this. I, I didn't sense from, 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 from what I heard that people are, have, have any, um, have any strong commitment to advocating basic income as a, as a, as an alternative or a, a full-blown basic income and so on, but certainly, the thought that occurred to me was that without people naming it in those terms, some of the specific things people talked about in the adequacy session, in the financing session, so on, is that we can use the idea of basic income and apply it in quite particular ways to achieve some of its advantages without at the same time having to uh, uh, opt for a fully blown integrated tax and benefit system. For example, in the pensions area, we can still retain a form of social insurance pension, but perhaps uh, without calling it a basic income, have some kind of uh, encompassing universal type pension for everybody aged over 65, for example. So that while, while the overarching idea might not, uh, might not get many uh, signatures and support, using the idea in particular areas does, I think. Um, a third area of concern that, that comes across, certainly it's very, very central to, to, to the, the report Helen and Anne-Marie composed, are the areas of relate, interrelated areas of children and gender. And there are, two, there are two very, very specific sets of ideas here that I think I didn't, I didn't uh, discern any debate or any dissent from this idea. But uh, one, and, and let me take them in order. I mean, one idea which is concretely advanced as a distinct recommendation is the, the two-tier solution to child income support. And everybody's familiar with the, the current melange we have of working family payment, qualified child allowances, child benefit, and so on. The report firmly opts in favour of a two-tier solution. And I suppose what I detected from people's contributions as well was that haven't we heard this before? And why isn't it taking so long? And so the reference to the two-tier solution is a kind of is almost like a metaphor for how difficult it is to introduce systemic changes, how hard it is to unravel the knots that we've tied ourselves into. But it seems to me there uh, that, 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 that there is an, an, an open and shut case there. Um, the other the other area that that came up in contribution, certainly I, I think I'm correct in reading. Anne Marie and Helen in saying that they regard this as very central to uh, what the report is trying to do is that they they don't quite pose it this way, but certainly the the question there for government and for the readers and for citizens, taxpayers about uh, about uh, family formation, gender and children, so on, is the following: What would 
a child-related tax benefit system look like in the, under contemporary Irish conditions? And if the answer to that question is that, well, children is the presence or absence of dependent children is the really important distinction between one person's circumstances and another, then I think there's a strong, very, very strong logic in favour of as as we just pointed out in the relevant chapter of the report of restructuring our system of tax credits in favour of uh, units with children as against units without, rather than the current system, which is a hangover from the Mayo Breadwinner model, where we have this uh, system which is half based on marriage, half based on dependency, and so on. Now they seem to me that these are these are very challenging recommendations, and might even indeed raise legal and constitutional questions. But it seems to me that. Uh, uh, stripping away the vestiges of the old bread, male breadwinner model is central to the kind of reforms the the, uh, the, the, the report aspires to. The, on the financing question, um, we had a, that we had I, I put on the personal hat here, so I participate in in, in the study. Uh, there's a number of interesting questions came up here. Much of it, I think. Uh, it was convergent with the recommendations in the in the in the report itself. If you recall, the report raises the questions of uh, higher rates of employer and PRSI contributions, broader tax base more generally, limits on tax expenditures, greater reliance on capital and wealth taxes, and so on. Increased contributions for self-employed. Now, Barrett, in in, in, his, in his contribution, I think, if not explicitly, certainly implicitly, I, I, I think would have endorsed much of the drift of what the report was saying here. I think the the point that I took away from from uh, two of the points that I took away from Barrett that I thought were particularly interesting were he's kind of saying if the reforms you want are big ticket items, broadly based reforms that will substantially improve and uh, and imp and imply greater expenditure. His point is saying is that the sorts of changes you're going to need to make on the financing fronts are likewise going to have to be big ticket. They're going to have to be changes and improvements and increases in the funding you get from broadly based taxes, including income tax, property taxes, value added taxes, and so on. And, he, and he, I think his argument is that there's no way around that. Now, of course, at the margins, how one designs these changes is obviously critically important. But, but for instance, he made a he made a straightforward case for saying, even in the case of value added taxes, which are which we know are disproportionately borne by people on lower incomes, that that a well designed increase in value added tax, most of that increase in taxes in any event will still be paid for by 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 people in higher income groups. He raised a very interesting question about the, the council's reliance on a side, a side value taxes um, uh, as a as an alternative to local property tax, and I think um, I I, det I detected say a, a degree of caution from Barrett uh, from Barrett in as much as he would uh, he would I think hesitate about attempting to replace the LPT with something like a site value tax because the LPT uh, has been inherently a growth enhancing equity inducing tax and one that's kind of working well and there's no tax like an old tax and so on so don't mess with it so to speak so there were the points I, I took on the financing front I want to conclude if I may with a couple of points just to indulge myself if I may a little bit about about kind of future analysis, future research, and so on. Um, first of all, I mean, it's, it strikes me that uh, in grappling with the kind of problems that the report identifies, uh, both, both identifying problems and dealing with them and finding implementable solutions, the kind of research and the kind of analysis we need to do might actually need to change a little bit, it strikes me. Um, I mean, people in the academic trade, they're well used to these well-grounded and analytically driven NESC reports. We're well used to now to making as much as we possibly can from the existing large-scale databases like EU Silk and so on. Uh, and, and it strikes me that 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 kind of research routine, it's saying, I think needs to be qualified by a more, for one for a better term, a more active uh, self-designed program of policy research coming from the DEASP itself. And so it seems to me that many of the questions we're talking about require kind of research and studies that go beyond the, the rich, quantitatively sophisticated things like EU silk and so on. I mean, it just, just to take one, 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 one simple example, 
we've been we in the, the report makes rightly makes uh, uh, an analytical case for a more individualized approach to taxes and benefits and so on uh, for all kinds of very very uh, obvious reasons that will occur to all the participants here but it would be very interesting to know wouldn't it before doing something like that how are the household finances of low-income households in particular managed as between spouses and partners I mean, is there a degree of individualization there accepted? Is there a degree there that's culturally accepted and embedded in social practice in households or not? Or how traditional are the household management practices? And there's a whole body of social research on that kind of literature and applying and doing that kind of research in large context might actually give us some clues to how individualization might in fact work in practice, particularly in, in low-income families. Or in the case of qualified adults, I mean, these are, these are a very interesting group, if I can put it, no stronger than that, about which you actually know very little, and yet, and, and are predominantly female, and yet we actually know very little about who they are, what their life histories are, what their education status is, what their experience of service, employment, and education is. And it seems to me that these two, these two things are examples of, uh, if I can call it that, a tailor-made, tailor-designed research that we need to undertake, that go beyond, if you like, our standard a repertoire of reviews of the literature and the existing databases and so on. Or, or to take yet another example, which Sean Green hinted at in, in, in his contribution. We, we know very little at, at the level of individual companies, what the interaction of employers is and companies as units of, of action and, and social protection. So for instance, is, this, is it a strategic part of small employers behavior? to uh, use part-time employees because they understand and employees fully understand the interaction of part-time employees, uh, job seekers, benefit rights, and the employer's needs. Likewise, are employers strategically using and aware of the working family payment and does that affect their wage levels they offer and so on? And they, it seems to me that the only way of coming at, coming at answers to those sort of intricate questions is to actually find ways, innovative ways. Uh, if I could use the word, I'm sure Anne-Marie would like me to use this word. Let's call it, for want of a better word, fieldwork research about how the system is actually operating on the ground. And it seems to me we need to, need to enrich our thinking and research along those lines in the future. And finally, of course, just on this final kind of repertoire of, of research points, uh, I mean, I had experience of being on a recent, in recent years of a Departmental working group on the on the disability allowance, their group called Make Work Pay, and that alerted me to the the, uh, the the presence of the administrative data, which is really quite important and a very very rich source of um, a very very rich vein of evidence indeed, that could be applied. And it seems to me that uh, I, I would to anybody from DESP who's listening that that working group. Uh, used the existing database on beneficiaries to generate some interesting data on the beneficiaries' incomes, their employment history, and so on. And there is a wealth of data which is otherwise unavailable uh, in that administrative data. And I'd, I'd like to see some kind of program of research built around that slightly more nuanced, a uh, slightly more nuanced research strategy. Uh, now, having slightly chastised the Department of Employment and Social Protection, I should conclude, will conclude indeed, with thanking them again for, for prompting this study into action. And of course, thank Anne-Marie and, uh, and Helen for, for concluding the report. I hope everybody enjoyed the day. I, at this point, I'll hand over to Larry, who I think is now going to conclude the day on our behalf. Um, thank you so much, Tony, uh, for, for that summation. Uh, I think that was really wonderful that you were able to, to, to go through so much and, and, and pull it all together for us. And uh, particularly, I think even your closing remarks around future research is very useful. Uh, the only difficult part I found out, Tony, during was that you had the 07 Sam behind you. Uh, <laughs> and if there has to be a sense of when is enough and is enough, you know. No. Um, no. But anyway, that not, notwithstanding that, I think it was really fantastic. And uh, again, I'd like to reiterate that, I mean, the support you get for this project uh, over, I suppose, nearly two years that the work was going on in this, Helen. And uh, I think it was, it was tremendous to get your, your, your insight. Um, I firstly have to apologize. Liz Canavan, who's the Assistant Secretary in the Department of Taoiseach, was due to be with us. 
Uh, but as many of you would probably know, Liz is, is heavily involved in the, in the COVID response and has literally just now been called back to another meeting. So she sends her apologies. Um, so rather than repeat, uh, I mean, I think Tony, you've really given us a, a great uh, agenda to think about uh, after the conference today. I think one of the overarching takeaways for me is this idea that we, we probably need to switch our mindset in the way that, again, Sean Marine described to thinking of, of ourselves as a wealthy country, which is trying to look at how we enable citizens. And I think that very powerfully example he gave us of thinking about micro enterprises and the interaction between different types of supports in that context is, is really powerful for us. So I think that the, the type of ideas that you summarized for us, Tony, would be fantastic in, in, in thinking about next steps within NESC in terms of work we might do in this area, um, but also I think within the wider system. And I know we have a lot of people on the call from uh, the Department of Social Protection, but also people from finance and expenditure and form. Um, so we're, I think we have, a, a, you know, given a lot of people a lot of food for thought today. Um, it just remains for me just to thank a, a number of people. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the, uh, the, the technology for all of this has been managed for us by Groove Yard, uh, Sylvia and Sinead in the background and Carl have done a, again a fantastic job. Uh, I think the idea of, of doing it and going out to breakout gr uh, rooms gave us a little bit of a deep breath to see whether that would work, but I think it did and I think it really did give an opportunity for people to have a more in-depth uh, discussion and certainly I enjoyed the one in finance. Uh, I think it was really great. It just gave us a chance to get into a bit more of the detail. Um, in terms of the, the, the colleagues here in NES, the, the project has been managed so ably by Edna Jordan and, pa and Paula Henley here in terms of getting, you know, as many of you will know, that have been involved directly uh, contacting people about their speeches and etc. in advance. Um, it couldn't have happened without so many people uh, to, uh, being willing to provide uh, inputs for us on the day, right from all of the speakers through this morning's sessions, uh, members from the council giving their perspectives, and then to the, the thematic sessions, both the people who get the keynote and uh, the chairs, and then for all of the people who participated in those discussions. As I always say, I think in these kind of events, it really only works because the 150 people today took the time to actually come on and listen to our discussions. So I'd like to thank every single one of you for doing that. Um, I think the just to, two other people to mention, I think Anne-Marie and Helen have championed this area through their work in jobless households and right up to taking on this request from the department and working on this report and all the various background papers. So I, I really would like to say a huge thanks to them uh, for, for sticking with this work and having to if you'll choose the, one of the words of, of, of the day, which seems to be to pivot, I mean, to have to think about the whole report when COVID hit and to have to kind of write that epilogue chapter and think about how the ideas sort of line up with what was happening around COVID. And I think we heard some very positive uh, remarks today that in fact, the, the report had, had, had anticipated a lot of the issues that came up in terms of the COVID response. Um, finally, for me, it's just to, as I say, to thank uh, uh, Professor Anthony McCashin. I think, as I said, Tony, you've been great on this project right through, and I think your summation today uh, really, really helps us all in terms of next steps around this. So I would really like uh, to, to, as, to, to wish you all uh, a nice weekend, and, uh, and uh, I look forward to, to uh, having you back at another event in NESC in the not dis too distant future. Hopefully, we're, we're transitioning back to having events where we will actually get to meet online. Uh, or sorry, face to face, which would be absolutely fantastic. So it just remains for me to say thank you and uh, have a nice weekend, everybody.